You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Tuesday, February 13th, 2024, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. Evan Bernstein. Hi, everyone. And George Robb. Hello, children. Hey, George. What's happening? What's happening, gentlemen? Thank you for joining us for the show. George, I got a question for you. Go hit me, please. So, what what are you going to rename Pennsylvania to? Oh, I think I think uh, I think Georgetown. Georgetown. That's, that's yeah. That's yeah. my. That's or or maybe some kind of like Geoville. Uh, a, a, a Geoville, or maybe just like fried fried Donerton. Mm-hmm. Fried fried Donerton would be good for Pennsylvania. I think. Bob, yeah. isn't your suggestion Transylvania? Turn it into that. I would, would love that. It? Oh my gosh, that'd be wonderful. All Transylvania. The Welcome that would be to cool. Transylvania. Exactly. You know, the commercials write themselves. Seriously. Unbelievable, right? That's where we're at. That's where we're at now. Man, that's where we're at. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. You know where we are? Speaking of fried dough, t- today's today's Ooh. Mardi Gras. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys are aware. It's the Fat, Fat Tuesday. Tuesday. Fat yeah. Tuesday? Well, yeah, shit, in, really? in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Dutch have this thing called Faschnacht. You ever heard of that? No. What the hell is okay. that? Knocked me. Fried so, night? Well, a Faschnacht, uh, yeah, somehow I'm not sure what exactly literally it means, but it's a big, flat donut. It's a big, flat, delicious Pennsylvania donut. Yeah, and what you do big, on Faschnacht Day yeah. is you make these donuts. And you eat traditionally, because they're made out of uh, lard and sugar and butter and fat, these were mm. all the items you wanted to get out of your pantry because Lent was going to be starting. Mm. So the most okay. efficient way to do uh. that was to make this that fantastic little flat pan, not pancakey, but like a donutty kind of pillowy, fat, happy, just thing that you just eat like a monster on Tuesday. So happy Faschnacht, ladies and gentlemen. I haven't, I, I didn't have one today because I'm trying to be smart and trying to be good. Yeah. But this is the day where you have a big Pennsylvania donut and start your Lenten season. Uh, George, right. I have a question. Yeah. If you're not going to participate in this, what are you going to do with all the lard in your cupboard? Oh, well, I have plenty of uses. Don't worry, Evan. I have plenty <laughs> of uses for that. But you got to get rid of it by uh, what? Can, by you, can you eat the lard even if you're not going to celebrate Lent? I guess. Well, I'm planning to swim the channel, so that's what I'm going to do that with my <laughs> lard. Steve, how long it. would the average person live if they ate lard for three meals a day? Oh, my God. <laughs> As part of how one I, third of how the day. How am I supposed to know that, Jim? One long weekend. You're a doctor. I mean, you went to school for <laughs> like 30 years, didn't you? I mean, what, what do they teach you, for Christ's sake? <laughs> didn't, you, didn't you minor in lard? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do, do you think we've doctor done that? Doctor of lard. We've done that experiment? <laughs> no, but you don't have to because people are doing it, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> sort of. I mean, you, 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 would, yeah. you would be significantly unhealthy within weeks, you know, if, if that helps you. But I don't know how long it would take to actually die from that. But you would probably start to get liver damage and you know, your blood sugar would go crazy and all kinds of stuff would – bad. you'd be able to, to, to see physiologically that bad stuff was happening probably within weeks. What if there were sprinkles too? Would that make a difference at all? Would that help or would that hinder? Well, what are, what are, they, pr- are they sprinkles or pro- Jimmy? Yeah. Well, yeah, sprinkles. Oh, here we uh, go. They have to be protein regional. sprinkles. Right. So, George, you got some some concert thing going on. Tell us about I, it. I do have a concert thing going on. So you <laughs> might you might be aware back in April, I released my eighth album, which is called Terpsichore. Yes. And this is an album that I recorded uh, sort of as a tribute to the records I grew up with in the 80s that I loved to dance to. Not those albums that necessarily were like club dance records, but records like by bands from like Talking Heads and The Police and Duran Duran that I just, to me, they were great dance albums. They were very groove oriented and they were just fun to jump around your bedroom and listen to them at full volume. And I recorded an album called Tripsichore that was kind of my tribute to that. And I'm doing something I've never actually done before. I've done lots of shows, lots of concerts. I've done tribute shows where I've played other people's complete albums. I did... uh the uh, Dream Eternal. of the Blue Turtles. Yeah, you were the, uh, Steve was there for that show. Nice. I've done Dark Side of the Moon, the whole thing, on my podcast every now and then. I'll do an entire album. But this is the first time, live, I'm going to be playing one of my own albums, top to bottom, the entire thing. And it's going to be happening March 9th, oh. right here in Bethlehem. I have uh, uh, an expanded band, a seven-piece band, as well as three other guests that are going to be playing. And I am. we've had a couple rehearsals so far, and this could be without too much hyperbole, like the best production I've ever been involved in. Mm-hmm. I am so, oh. 
so excited. I think it's some of the best music I've ever written. Humbly, I can say that. And the people that I have, have got to, to play on this are just some of the coolest, most talented, loveliest humans. And I'm just super excited. That sounds awesome. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to be in New Hampshire when that's happening. Oh, okay. Well, no worries. But if anybody wants to come to the thing, you can uh, you can go to georgeschraub.eventbrite.com and you can get tickets for that. But it's it's the kind of thing that it's really a, a, a special event to be able to share in a musical experience. Like the, the 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 record is written, the album is written to be experienced kind of in a single chunk. It's mm-hmm. 51 minutes. I wrote it to be like this singular experience and uh, to have that happen live, it's really going to be special and extraordinary. So if you're anywhere close to Bethlehem, PA, if you're in Philly or New Jersey somewhere, Northern Jersey, come on over. Bethlehem is lovely. SGU f- fans might remember the Ice House, which is where we did our, uh, we did two no shows there. We had a wonderful time mm-hmm. in that venue. You guys remember we did a, a Boomer Zoomer. And we did some live uh, podcasts there. And so it's that venue, which is one of my favorite venues in the world. Uh, it just happens to be a quarter mile from my from my condo, which is great. <laughs> we also did the second SGU D&D game there. Oh, or that was nice. game. That was so much fun. That was right. cool. The first one being during our 24-hour show. You guys remember that? Mm? Oh, I yeah. do. Absolutely. Super yeah, fun. Our friend Doug ran fun. that game. Yeah. Maybe we should do a third one sometime. What do you think? Ooh, yeah. All right. There may be occasions to do that. George, have you no ever reasons. role-played in your life? Uh, the closest I got was, uh, I mean, if you mean like role-playing like D&D kind of game kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, no, I, I, the closest I got was when we did the, uh, the space thing at the ice house Yeah, right. where I was, I was the mm-hmm. entertainment robot or whatever I was. I forget what I was. That's the closest I ever, I ever came. I've never actually done the dice rolling, throwing, mm-hmm. rolling thing. I know you've tried to convince me a bunch of times that it's great. And I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure it's wonderful, but I have a, I have a blockage, I think. (laughs) (laughs) It's possible. I'm not going to pretend it's for everyone, but my experience has been that everyone, unless you're like just a total, already a full blown nerd, but most people have a blockage until they play it. And they, and at Mm. some point they, they learn like what actually happens and what they're supposed to do. Right. Right. And and you have to get over that hump. And once you're over that hump, then it's fun. Then it's a ton of fun. But yeah. There's, it, a, there's a number of humps I need to get over, I'm sure. And that's that's definitely one of them. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I'd be curious. What, what would you recommend as a newbie? What what should I play? What would be the best thing for me to first do? The best thing you should would first do would be to do a tabletop game with one of the novella boys. Okay. One-on-one? That's like, that's just yeah. like. Small group, five people. Oh, five people. Okay. Yeah. All right. The okay. one off a one off game. Like there there are there are games that are designed to run in one session. You know, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does one stick out as particularly fantastic? What's the name of that movie one, Jay, that we do every now and then? Director's Cut. Director's Cut, yeah. That's that'd be a good yeah. one to start with. Low All stakes, right. yeah. It's All a right. super super easy game system. Like you know, as a new player you wouldn't have to think about anything. And it's all about the immersion, right? The, the yeah. person running the game, you know, sets sets the tone, tell you, you know, tells you the environment, like you know, presents to you this scenario that you're going to have to deal with. I would, I don't know. I mean, do you like fantasy, George, or do you like things that are more like reality based? I, I like, I'm, I'm a little more reality based. I mean, I like the science fiction and stuff. The fantasy never, never quite connects. Sometimes it does, but never okay, quite connects. We'll play with me. Cthulhu. Yeah, but role, yeah, yeah, role playing yeah. could be horror, could be modern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be, we did, we did a mafia one that was really oh, God, fun. Okay. so much fun. Oh, oh so okay. that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe like if I knew it was being recorded, I could see it as a performance and then I would like get over the, cause I've, you know, I, I'm, I'm fine with performing. It's the weird thing of like I'm sitting here with my friends talking in a weird accent. Mm-hmm. That's like that's the that's the part that would be hard for me to well, get you're, through. You're entertaining each but, other, but you, basically. I guess. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Let's do that. Let's make that happen, and we'll film George, it, and we'll post it, and then we'll we'll erase it. Hey George, right. you do accent. You do accents on your podcast. Just letting you know. So. Oh, I know, but that's just like me alone in a room. I couldn't do that in front of people. My goodness. Can you <laughs> Could you imagine if they ever heard that? Oh, you'd be mortified. <laughs> but speaking of which, though, it is good. I mean, and therapists do use role playing in order to teach skills, you know, social sure. skills and what to people. And, you know, I absolutely credit my role playing experience with my ability to get up in front of hundreds of people and perform or do whatever I got to do or give a lecture yeah. Yeah, sure. or, you know, control Lead the, the room. charge against the orcs, whatever it takes, whatever yeah. you have to do. <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I went into my role playing experience very different than I came out of it. 
in terms of like those skills, those skill sets. All right, let's get started. Bob, tell us about this new meta material. Thank you, Steve. This is your quickie with Bob. Uh, yes, meta, not uh, not meta material this time, but meta lenses in the news, which is which is a little bit different. Okay, I'll start with a little known fact: the human eye itself actually does some super fast processing of images before the visual data is downloaded into the brain's visual cortex to do the heavy lifting. That's just an interesting fact I've known for a while that actually plays into this news item. Uh, electrical engineers at Penn State have now, they've accomplished a similar feat actually by using an optical component called a meta lens to pre-process image data before sending that data to an artificial intelligence system. So now the, the AI systems that can recognize objects in a scene We've seen them. We've heard about them. We've maybe even used them. They're amazing today, right? But processing all that complex data can be slow, can really slow it down and use a significant amount of computing power. These new meta lenses have nanostructures at different angles that can bend and transform the light instantly into a, into a different coordinate system that allows important parts of the image to be more clear and, and others to be less so, which then, of course, saves data bandwidth and processing time. It's like, it's like your eyes sending to your brain in-focus objects and other objects that are not in focus. They're just kind of blurred out, so your brain doesn't really bother trying to work on those. It's working on the things that, have been, that are clear and the, the important things, which saves, saves time and bandwidth. So now what they do is with this meta lens, it doesn't take any power. You just put it essentially right in front of the camera and it just works at essentially at the speed of light. The light goes through, it's, cha- it's automatically changed into this new coordinate system. Then the camera digitizes that and sends it and sends it to the to the AI. Researchers say a meta surface can be used in tandem with AI systems as a preprocessor, making it easier to recognize the same car from multiple street view cameras, or if it's applied to a satellite, it can potentially track planes from takeoff to landing, the entire process. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, so check it out online, Meta Lenses. This has been your Cookie with Bob. Back to you, Steve. Thank you, Bob. So guys, I want to give a little bit of a battery update. I know we, oh. I know we talk about batteries a lot. Well, a they, lot. They, you know, it's yeah. an important thing. It is a, but it's yeah. a very important technology. You know, you know, it could have a potentially dramatic effect on our world. And it, it's right at the nexus of the green energy transition, right? Fortunately, battery technology has been imp- improving continuously over the last yeah. 20, 30 years. Baby steps mainly. Well, it's incremental, but it's, yeah, but it's not okay. insignificant, though. It's, I would say significant, even though incremental, but cumulative to the point yeah. that the batteries today are much better than they were in every parameter. And they're continuing, and safer. And yeah. they're continuing to improve. The batteries, like the lithium-ion batteries that will be coming out next year are better than the ones that they had this year. You know, they're, have, they'll increase the energy density a little bit. They are using less of the rare earth materials. They are less That's likely good. to catch fire. They have a longer charge-discharge cycle, you know, life. They're just getting better. But, of course, we're anxious, we're, and we want, we want the more than the incremental improvement, right? We want— I don't. We want the big leap, though, right? Oh wait, no, I do. We do. It be you know, yes. If it's every, <laughs> if every year it's five percent, ten percent better, that's awesome. But damn, we want to, we want a doubling. Like we just want a tripling. We want it. Yeah, it's, you know, if you're young, five percent's good. But at our age, we want big improvements. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, but it's not just it's that, Bob. Point. If we're calculating out like how fast we're going to make this green transition, true. Then the more quickly the batteries improve, the better. That ha- that could have a huge impact. Oh, we're doomed anyway. Just go ahead. Not true, but <laughs> yes, but but but. Have you been reading the news? <laughs> screwed. One thing that I find frustrating, though, because you know I have a, an electric vehicle, I own a Tesla, and it's honestly just this is just my honest opinion. It's awesome. It's an awesome car. I love it. I love driving it. It's so convenient. Of course, we we can charge at home because we have a or we own our own parking space. Although you know, yeah, that I've been in that car many times. Haven't driven it, but. You know, sometimes I'm happy I don't have one because I think I would kill myself. The acceleration, you are in off the hook. A race car, it's off the hook. I think I would be mm-hmm. testing it, testing the acceleration here and there. I, I really think I would hurt myself. It's fast, and you know, we've never put the pedal to the metal. I've never really, really opened up the car as far as it can go. You get to a point where you're like, all right, that's fast enough. You know, like, that's yeah. enough. And it's scared, right? It's it, scary. It's, it's incredible, but it's still. 
the, the number one reason people give for why they they don't want to buy an EV is range anxiety. Oh my god! Which doesn't really make sense because the you know the, Not the car's range is like yeah, like two fifty to three hundred fifty miles is more than you know what ninety percent of people need for ninety five percent of their driving. But anyway, the the more range you, that we build into the cars, I think the more acceptance there would be. So plus oh, yeah. plus. The greater the energy, the specific energy, right? So remember, there's energy density, which is energy per volume, and specific energy, which is energy per mass. Um, although they do tend to go hand in hand w- recently with with battery technology. But the the lighter you could make the battery, that also gives you more range because you're not dragging a heavy battery around. So you actually it magnifies the benefit of the increased the increased specific energy of the it's battery. Like, it's like the rocket. The rocket equation, equation the, right? The fuel Light, for the lighters to, better. To move the fuel. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, so if you had, you know, double the energy, the specific energy of the battery, you would get more than double the range, you know, if by cutting it in. Or you would have more than the same range by cutting it in half because you're picking up the benefit of having a lighter mm-hmm. battery. All right, so anyway, but... I, yeah, I, where you I, going? Want, I want someone to design a, a manual transmission electric car. <laughs> if someone could do that for me, that would be really... I'd, I'd appreciate that. They exist. There are there are retrofits. You know, really? Yeah, yeah. People, really? people people retrofit electric engines into old cars. With no, I whatever, know, but, uh, but I still want the want. Sh- I want the shift though. I still want to have yeah, to I'm do saying, the actual. It's not going to be as efficient, that, George. They, there's there's no really? production car that does that, but there are right. individual. You can go to a garage that will do that for you. But anyway, what are the prospects for? A, I hate to use this term, but we all use it—a quantum leap in battery. Uh, <laughs> in battery. I feel. I feel that for show. you, Steve. Yeah. I feel for you. Sometimes you just got to accept the stupid, <laughs> right, right. The stupid uh, but, expressions. What's the new paradigm? Yeah. What? what where, what's? Yeah. Where, where, where is it? We're going? only going to push the envelope. So, <laughs> but first, George, we have to think outside the box. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So the, we already talked about the Amprius battery, which is a doubling. That was like, okay, boom, we, we shift, we switch yeah. from graphite anode to silicon anode and basically doubled the energy density and specific energy nice. of the lithium ion battery. They're, they're making them initially for planes because uh, the, the, you know, the reduced weight is more valuable there. But, but they're, they're saying they will produce them for vehicles probably 2026, thereabouts. But – for, they're not the only ones doing that. So Panasonic, who makes the car batteries for Tesla and makes 10% of the batteries, EV batteries in the world, it, Oof, they, are, they are developing a silicon— Solid state battery? Nope, a silicon anode lithium ion battery. So, they, so like Amprius, so they're, they, those, are for, those are produced for cars. So I don't know what's going to come out first, but very soon, within a year or two, maybe three at the most, we're going to have essentially a doubling— of the capacity of these lithium ion batteries. I mean, so what? Nice. A, a, over a thousand mile range? Well, it'll no, be no, half the weight. A doubling it'll of cut the, the cur- weight. Well, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, you, you go either way, but it's like, it's, it's, you're talking about Bob going from like a 350 range to a 700 mile range at the same weight or some compromise. Right. Like maybe you go to 500 miles, but you make it lighter. Um, it's also be cheaper. So bringing the price down is good. Oh my God! Yes, there's a lot. Of, it's like so that's many, big. so many a lot of advantages. All advantages. There's so yeah. many advantages. All advantages. All right, but that's not that's not what I want to talk about either. What I want to talk about oh, is <laughs> flow okay. batteries. Get to the point. If you guys, you guys, I don't think we've talked about flow batteries. Flow batteries. That gal from Progressive on the TV. Yeah, flow. <laughs> flow. So flow batteries are called that because they essentially they have the electrolyte rather you know, rather than being in metals, it's in a liquid. So you have these two liquids that exchange electrolytes, and that's what generates the electrical charge. They are safer they ha- than lithium-ion batteries. They have um, less of a chance of, you know, they're more stable. They operate under a, a broad temperature range, less of a chance that they'll catch fire. Uh, so they're, they're, they're better in many parameters, except one. The, cost. The one, no, they, they should be cost competitive with lithium-ion Ooh, batteries. Wait. Their energy density is only 10% that of lithium-ion batteries. Oh, right, right, right. So you need 10 so that's a, that's a deal killer for electric vehicles. It may, it may be okay for grid storage, but it's a deal killer for electric vehicles. There's one huge advantage, though, potentially, potentially, because, because they're liquid batteries, you can easy to replace. You can swap out the electrolyte yeah. fluid as Ooh, a as, as a form for rapid charging. No, so you yeah. could oh, rapid you charging. could pull up to a, a gas to a quote unquote gas station, connect a hose to your car, 
exchange your fluid, and you're fully charged and ready to go in five minutes. So it would be basically be the same experience as filling up your tank with gas. Wow. That would be awesome. That's, a, that's, that's big. That's, that's significant. You, you can also charge it the traditional way, so it's like the best of both worlds. You can charge up at home, but if you need a quick charge on the road, you just fill her up like you would a, like you would a gas car, and you're ready to go. But there, there goes the range exactly. So we need right. more energy yeah, exactly. dense flow batteries. What's the catch, though? Yeah, like yeah. what's the so well. The- the catch is the 10% the density. D- density. D- density. The 10%. However, okay. Bob, I have one word for you. <gasps> Nanofluids. Nanofluids. What? Nanofluids. What you, got my, you got uh, my attention. Sign Bob up right now. But you're not talking about nanomachines. Yeah, what does that mean, <laughs> nanofluids? A, so these researchers, this is back in 2009, did a proof of concept where they, instead of just using electrolytes, they used these nanites dissolved or suspended in the fluid in their flow battery. And they showed that you could get much higher energy density. Then they were given a grant by guess who? Tesla. DARPA. Exxon. DARPA. Oh. DARPA, yeah. DARPA yeah, energy, yeah. although they call it ARPA energy. I don't know if that's a typo or if yeah. but it's the same place, you know. Uh, so they were so you know, DARPA does those technology challenges where they, they, they give a lot of grants, but they also do those like million you know, you win a million dollars per person to do this. Um, oh right. Like the Google Challenge yeah. has one. Yeah, but SpaceX I haven't heard anything one. like that in a while. Right. Though. So they developed it into a working battery, and then the researchers started their own private company, Influid Energy, to make to commercialize it. So it's interesting, you know, the whole process. It was initially researchers who then got a government grant and are now going private, and they're getting government contracts to help commercialize it. So it's mm-hmm. like the completely intertwined development process between academia, government, and private company. Uh, but it's all the same people in all those stages. Anyway, they are claiming that they have a nanofluid flow battery that's working right now with yeah. double the uh, <gasps> energy capacity of lithium ion batteries. They're claiming um in fact that, wait, in fact capacity or density? Specific well, density? Specific energy and 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 energy density. So by volume okay. and mass. In fact, even better than where Amprius currently is. They're claiming that their design would get between 550 to 850 watt <gasps> hours per kilogram. So just to put for perspective, like yeah. the best Tesla battery right now is just shy of 300. So 850, you're almost getting to triple. You know, like the middle of that range is yeah. double. Um, the best you know EV battery that we have now. And there may even be a little bit more headroom there. So part one of the variables is what percentage of the fluid is the nanoparticles. Right now, they say they, they got up to 50% by weight. So, like the, so the electrolyte fluid with suspended nanoparticles is 50% by weight, the nanoparticles. And of course, the greater the percentage, the greater the energy density of the energy storage, right? The density of the energy storage. They claim they can get up to 80%. And, and at 80%, I think that's where you get like that maximum 850. Yeah, sweet spot. Yeah. What out? I think the triple current energy density. And they say okay. that this could be, that, you know, this is, they're commercializing this. There's, this is to be produced, like mass produced as an EV battery. They've solved all the problems. They're just doing it. And How soon do we see it in action? Yeah, but you, I don't know. It's going to be at least be a couple of years, I would imagine. To, to, what? You said they're right there. You're right yeah, but, there. Yeah, are they why, ready to start? When you're right there, but to build the factory, to get the things going, it's always two, three years, right? But they must have prototypes or something. Yeah, show me a prototype, man. They had a working prototype in 2013. And we're hearing about so this. So they proved this 11 10, years later. 11 yeah. years why? later? So this is how long it takes to, to get to the point where they're, like, where they're ready, to, ready to commercialize it. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so then the question becomes... You know, remember, technology is not just about the technology, right? It's also about infrastructure. And the question is, I mean, I think the good thing about this battery is that even with existing infrastructure, you could use it exactly like you use a lithium-ion battery, right? Yeah, just charge it at home or at a station. Yeah, a charging station. So It doesn't even need the fluids yet. Exactly. It doesn't need the fluid exchange. And then as they build in the infrastructure to swap out the fluids, that is extra added convenience on top of it. It's almost perfect. It's almost perfect. You'll have... yeah. If you couldn't charge it, they'd be kind of screwed. Yeah. They'd have to wait for the infrastructure. But now they don't have to wait, and then the infra- infrastructure will come, and then they'll be even better. More it people w- will even want it. Mm-hmm. So it works with current charging technology, and in the future, it will only be better. Yeah. And it'll be ready to go when that what's infrastructure the, what's is What's the there. volume for the fluid for a, for a vehicle? 
Are we talking like similar, like 10 gallons? It, kind so of they, stuff, no, they talking? said it'll be about the same size as a current EV battery. That, so the volume of a lithium ion battery. That okay. Which is kind of big, right? It's, They're it's big. Not, yeah. There's a lot of batteries in there. But that's, so, so it yeah, could so be like 30, 40 gallons or something. I don't know what, I don't actually right. know what the volume is, but that's I mean, what they said. So yeah, so it, it, wow. it, basically it's all within parameters of what would be necessary yeah. in order for it to function within, with an electric vehicle. Yeah, so uh, you know, wow. the thing is there's a bunch of these technologies that are sort of being developed in parallel while we're maximizing the lithium ion battery. Uh, I, when I was doing research for this piece, I found a good Nature article that reviewed like all of the ones that are that are up and coming. So here was a couple of them. They, they have sodium ion batteries, lithium sulfur batteries, lithium metal batteries, and solid state lithium air batteries. You notice how they all have lithium? Most of them are lithium, and one is sodium. Do you know why that yeah, is? Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. Why is that? Because lithium is the lightest element that you could use in this way, right? It's the lightest metal. It's the it's the third. You know, element, element on the periodic tab- table, and sodium is right below it on the periodic tables. That's the next heaviest. Yeah, and same. So column. it's the lightest thing with those properties that you would need to make a, ba- a good battery out of it. So you, you, there's no getting better than lithium. And if you want to, if you want to pack, a, you know, electrons per mass, you know, that's like the best we could do. That's why they all use lithium. Now, the the best one in terms of like the potential, because the article reviewed like here's where we are now and here's the potential. The one with the highest potential solid state? was the solid state batteries. Yeah. And they <laughs> the, the wow. nature article said that they should be able to get up to twelve hundred watt hours per kilogram, Ooh. which is basically four times existing. Yeah, but when? When's, when's the prediction the, for that? I've been reading about solid state batteries for years, and I know that yeah, I know me, that sort of too, but. that some versions of them are are exist now. There's like a Japanese company, a Chinese company working on solid state batteries. I think they're starting at like twice the lithium ion battery energy density, but they have the potential to get to four times, which would be amazing. You know, I mean, that's then where it's way more than I, you know, I say that now. But like I, like I said about every hard drive I've ever owned, it's way more than we would ever need, right? <laughs> right. But uh, um, two hundred gig hard drive for cars, well, anyway. Of course, you need? for electric airplanes, like there is no too yeah. much. Like, then it's right. Yeah. Then yeah. you're talking. Yeah. So this could really make electric vehicles. aviation really viable. But I think for that size planes. Yeah. The bottom yeah. line is with so many options in development, and they all look very promising, and we're all at either the prototype stage or the in development or the commercialization stage or whatever. Definitely by like the 2030s, we're going to be at the two oh, the yeah. two to three times our current typical uh, battery capacity in terms of you know energy density and, and specific energy than we are now. Yeah, and we're impatient. It's going to be a totally different world at that point when you think yeah, about it like EVs and grid storage. You know. Anyway, I like to keep myself updated on the battery tech, and this is one big sort of news item this All right. week. So the days of incremental tiny. I think I think it's steps accelerating because yeah. yeah, because there's still incremental advances with just a regular lithium ion battery. That's that tech gets better every year, but now we're seeing like all of this stuff that we've been reading about for 10, 15 years and often talking about on the show. They're all right. sort of getting ready to come to fruition with shifting to another technology that is again like a significant advance all at once rather than just another small incremental advance good stuff yeah it's good stuff yeah we'll be saying remember remember those lithium ion batteries <laughs> yeah. remember that tesla novella used to drive <laughs> it's a shame though because the, the the guys that draw the little battery you know how to put the battery into the flashlight they're probably going to be out of a gig so oh, yeah, i always totally. like those little diagrams <laughs> yeah. i feel bad for those guys but yeah, yeah i guess Aww. you gotta adjust I wonder what the upper limit is here, you know, like, yeah, the theoretical upper limit of physics. Yeah, I don't know. I should know this. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm serious. I should. You should, Bob. It's not, it's not as epic as you would think. It's not like, you know, the uh, science fiction movies, the physical limit, you know, battery technology at the limit of physics would be really cool, but not just, not as mind bendingly, holy crap, as you might think, but still pretty intense. I, that's always, that always gets me. That's always, that's one of the most common and flagrant gimmies in science fiction shows when like they have some technology that has just ridiculous energy. Like, where's it coming from? Or <laughs> like Iron Man's, uh, yeah, like Iron Man's suit. Yeah. The, yeah. When he's flying through the air, it's like, where are you keeping all your propellant? You, know, you would need a massive propellant tank on your back to be doing what you're doing. It's the arc reactor. That's what's doing Well, that's it. the energy, but that's not even yeah. – like yeah, He thing. needs propellant well, you're right. to, to what's, push what's forward. What's it igniting? Yeah, what's, what's – <laughs> yeah, 
Anyway, what's the arc reactor, guys? Come yeah, it's on. okay. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I'm okay no, with that. No, it's, it's not fun. clear here. It's clear I know. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's that's the gimme, but it's like it's called yeah. N- Noah's Ark. That's reactor. one of the biggest gimmies in science fiction. It's right up there with. Let's just ignore the whole interstellar radiation thing. <laughs> you know, it's it's <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, Steve, <laughs> Steve, you and I do a lot of writing for for you know like tabletop gaming. And yeah, I'm, I'm writing a screenplay right now, and I am like really struggling with getting my fiction in line with science. Yeah. It's not easy. It takes easy. work. It takes work. It, it takes a lot of world work. that makes sense. Yeah, like just the world building rules like, you know, you can't just willy-nilly it. It's got to be it's got to all be inter you know, it's got to be consistent. It's got to be like intertwined with itself. Mm-hmm. It's a hard thing to do. It really is. Well, if you're trying to make quality, yes. Yeah, Otherwise, but as a, as a nuts. skeptic, you know, we've been doing this for so long. Like I'm like I'm picking up I'm like, "Oh my god, what about this? What about this? What about this? You know, I'm like, this. <laughs> it's getting in the way of your creative juices. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, right? I think it, it makes it better because then in the end, it when will, you solve it's the true. problem, you make the world more consistent, more interesting. Definitely. That's you what know? Scott Sigler does, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah. like Scott, yeah. I remember having a conversation with Sigler years ago where he like, he wanted to be able to have directions in space. And as the more he thought about it, like between galaxies and stuff, the more it was like, well, there's no frame of reference. So, like, how would one ship know where the other ship is without a frame of reference? Like, you can't. Mm-hmm. And he was trying to figure out the most basic thing, which, like, is sort of sloughed all over in every kind of science fiction space travel story of, like, okay, we're here and we want to go to this other place. How do we do that? So he had to just, I think he spoke with Phil Plate and a bunch of other people to try to figure out some way to be able to make some kind of a system where you can just go from A to B. Yeah, over massive distances in space where there's no up or down or you mm-hmm. know left or right. Right, and the problem, and don't forget, it might even if you found a way to solve that, and you know, which is totally doable. The problem is, it might be good for a millennia, but then after that, like, right. oh, you got to recalibrate because right. everything's moving. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, going through hyperspace ain't like dusting crops, boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jay, you're going to tell us about another green technology: green roofs in urban settings. Yeah, so recently, a study was published in Nature Cities and. This was led by Indria Adelkanova and Professor Gunyan Yoon of uh, Kiyong He University. Uh, I'm giving myself three SGU points for pronouncing all those. (laughs) The current and future problems is urban overheating, which is only getting worse because, as you know, global warming, right? It's changing our climate. So this is a really serious issue because today, approximately 56% of the world's population live in cities. So this is about 4.4 billion people. We had a scorcher of a summer in New England here, you know, last year, and it was incredibly worse the further south that you go. What can we do to mitigate, you know, this problem that we absolutely know is going to happen? Jay, as an aside, do you know what the heat island effect is? Have you ever heard that term? The heat covalent? The heat island effect. Like in the city, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I've read about that. Yeah, cities give off a lot of heat, basically, and so that that ra- raises the temperature. For a while, the climate change deniers were saying that you know the Earth isn't warming; that it's just that all of our temperature detectors are close to cities, and they're just detecting the heat island effect, which, of course, climatologists know about and corrected for, or that you know, they also use te- you know temperature sensors that are not near civilization, so that you can control for that effect. But anyway, that that you know tangentially relates to what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I lived in this city, um, and it's like a battery. Like it it absorbs the solar radiation all day, and at night it's still stinking hot because all that heat is radiating out of the the blacktop and the buildings and everything. Like it, you know, it's traditionally hard to live in you know during the summertime in a city where there's a lot of concrete and a lot of pavement. So anyway, the the investigators. We're looking into the impact of something called green roofs on urban temperature regulation and energy consumption reduction. So a green roof, also known as a rooftop garden or a living roof, this is a roof of a building that is partially or completely covered with some type of vegetation. Scientists are researching green roofs to help mitigate urban overheating, and surprisingly to me, they're very effective. So the research shows that green roofs are definitely an effective and scalable nature-based solution for mitigating these effects. The science behind a green, green roof makes a lot of sense here. So the vegetation and soil layer allows for water evaporation, right? Pretty straightforward. Water, When a water evaporates, it cools the surface that it's, it's being evaporated from. 
right? Some of the heat, you know, is in the water as it goes up and, and floats away. So the green roof also acts as insulation for bu- the buildings that it's on top of, and this lowers the building's cooling energy needs. There are two variations of green roofs. They perform differently as well. So we have something called extensive green roofs, and these these are like the lightweight version. They require minimal maintenance. You know, usually they're not accessible by people. They have a shallow layer of soil or or a different growing medium that's typically roughly two to six inches deep, supporting a drought-resistant plants uh, such as uh, sedums and grasses. And these these work very well. And you don't really need to um, to have a super complicated irrigation system, but the building could potentially still need some reinforcement to be able to handle the the weight of of everything that you would be adding to the roof of the building, particularly older buildings. The second type is intensive green roofs. And these are the heavier uh, version, and these require much more maintenance. They also need a lot more structural reinforcement, of course, because they're heavier. These can support a wider variety of plants, including you know trees and shrubs, you know things with extensive roots, root systems. Intensive green roofs are um, these are typically accessible by people and can include things like walkways and benches. You know, it's like a park. They have a, a deeper growing medium, right? So the the amount of soil that's there is going to be more than six inches, and if you dig into the details here, you can see like they already basically know what's needed to do this. And there's there's several layers that go into this, like kind of like building the, the outer wall of a house. You don't just put your siding on the plywood. You have to have, you, you know, you have to have like a water barrier. And there, there's things that need to be in place in order for this system to work. And also, of course, you can't have this thing leaking into the building, right? So there's lots of precautions that need to be taken. The researchers focused on non-irrigated extensive green roofs. Because they're less expensive, they're easier to implement, they're more likely to be implemented. You know, this might be the early adoption, most likely end up being the extensive green roofs, which are, like I said, the the less complicated one. The results of their study showed that increasing the coverage of green roofs definitely leads to more substantial reductions in both the temperatures and the energy use. So, for example, if a city had 90% of the buildings equipped with green roofs, now I know that's a lot. It is a lot, but they're just giving, you know, giving an ideal example. Like, okay, if we were able to make it so through government incentives and things like that, we could get 90% coverage here. What would it look like? There would be a decrease in the city's air temperature by up to 0.54 degrees Celsius. And I know that sounds like a small number, but it's actually significant. And the surface temperature would go down as much as 2.17 Celsius, which is very significant. Now, also, energy consumption for cooling was reduced approximately 7.7%. You know, right there, you know, that is definitely a, a significant change that if we incorporate a green, green roofs into urban areas, you know, there could be a lot of money saved and everything. But, of course, there's a rub, right? What's the, the skeptical angle here is this stuff is expensive, it is very expensive to do this. Building green roofs is, you know, re- it requires uh, structural changes. If a new building is going to do it, they have to build for it, you know, and it's going to cost more money. You know, but a good thing to keep in mind here, like as an example, in 2016, the North American green, green roof industry, it grew more than 10% with nearly 900 green roof projects, which totaled more than 4 million square feet reported in 40 U.S. states and six Canadian provinces. So, you know, people are doing it. They're finding the money. And there is a long-term benefit. And these these green roofs can last a very, very long time. You know, they're not something that has to be completely redone in three or four years. Like you put it in and it and it's, you know, it's self-propagating. You just keep, you, you, you maintain it. You do the things that you're supposed to do. And this thing will last for a, a long time. So the money in is worth it. It's just hard to get that money. I have one question. So I don't know if you encountered this anywhere, but if you compare having a green roof versus having solar panels on the roof, which one's better? Yeah, that's a freaking awesome question, Steve. I honestly don't know from an energy perspective. I mean, I was looking at the formulas, you know, like they give you the the megawatts and all that stuff. And I was trying to dive into that and really wrap my head around it and then trying to see if it's worth it. You know, like, is it really going to be a, a true money saver? The researchers are saying that it would absolutely be a net benefit for a city to to you know help foster the investments to make these things happen you know and in the end it costs money to protect people right so we're you know so solar panels won't have the same heat reduction as green roofs would right and and what are we trying to do yeah we want the solar panels of course because we want the energy creation 
the number of people living in cities is slowly increasing, you know, so we, we need to think about this stuff. This is one, you know, one solution. Um, I read an interesting thing where they were talking about living underground. You know, there's lots of ideas going around here. I just don't see living underground as a viable option. What about in a hobbit hole? Well, that's another thing. I mean, <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they're sandy, they're dry. They're they're welcoming. There's lots of food. There's cheeses. I mean, I'm all for it, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jay, is there a correlation between that effect and the effect of just white roofs? Because I remember reading about that years ago, about uh, just taking a city and changing all of the black roofs to white roofs has a significant heat effect. Yes, I read about that. They're called cool roofs. Yeah. And they hey. just, they don't they don't size up like the. That's like junior league and, and okay. green roofs are like major league. Right? It's Interesting. Like okay. Very, very different. I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that. You know, it, yeah, it's helpful. Yeah. You know, you see that school buses have white roofs and UPS right. trucks have white roofs. Like there is a benefit, definite. Um, so I'd like to, you know, this is the beginning. This was the, literally the first study, the real, real intensive first study that they've done. It takes a lot of money and time for, for researchers and scientists to dig in and figure out all the details. But this preliminary study is showing very, very positive results. And they'll keep doing it. They'll keep researching it. And we'll, you never know. We'll see what happens. Here in Bethlehem, there was a study done a couple of years ago where one portion of the city is very green in terms of trees and coverage and grassy areas. And another portion is not as much less so. And they did a study and they, they recognized because of the temperature difference between those two spaces in our own city within a, a span of a five or six mile area, there was a seven year life expectancy difference. Wow. Seven years difference between the places that had trees and were green and the places that didn't. It was astonishing, this data. So it shows the effect of just yeah, having green spaces. Plus the... Uh, that wasn't a controlled study, right? I mean, they they just said, you know, where is it green, where isn't it? <laughs> right, right. From my understanding, they yeah. didn't They didn't like make green spaces and see what happened. Right. So right. it's quite possible that people of higher socioeconomic status live in green, greener. Oh, for sure, for city. sure. Yeah. So I mean, it's interesting. Does it? But even that too, yeah, like yeah. to correlate that, and then yeah, there, there was a an IQ, lower IQ and higher, more high, higher temperature areas mm -hmm. that that you know that day to day living affects the uh, school testing and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's just it's just so f cu curious how something quote unquote as simple as like having more green everywhere can make it a can make such a difference. So well, yeah. we we also yeah we know that there's a huge psychological benefit to green spaces. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. All right, George, this is an unusual topic for the SGU. Tell us about Legos. Well, I'm assuming that much of your demographic is probably all of us that are chatting here today played with Lego when we were kids, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Did yeah, you, kids. Did you, I mean, they're I mean, I all had, over my house. I mean, I have two kids. And like adults. Legos are, are the thing, you know? Have you did, you did you keep any of your old Lego and then give it to your kids? Did that, did that, yes. Yeah, so we that did. made it the transition. That's fantastic. Well, I loved Lego as a kid. I still do. I think it's a great sort of kind of toy to have that inspires sort of creativity. Maybe over the years, the Lego sets have gotten a little bit more specific and less uh, less creative, but there's still a certain, I don't know, beauty in trying to create stuff and build stuff with your own hands and and vary away from the planning. And so I've always just loved Lego. Well, like model building. Really. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I just got a Lego can... Millennium Falcon for Jay's oh, oh, wow. Like the big one, the huge Would one. Would make point five past light. No, not uh, the big, big one, Steve. It's one, big. one to one scale. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one brick. It's just one gigantic. The big, brick. big one is like a thousand bucks. All right, this, the next big one. The it's next awesome. Big. It's awesome. <laughs> what a good <laughs> uncle. Well, to make you guys love Lego even more, Lego has helped develop with one of their workers. This guy named uh, Eric Ullerlund Stair. He was uh, worked for Lego. He just in his free time with some, some friends that also worked at Lego, uh, made these small scale MRI machines. So just <laughs> a model of an MRI machine because he realized that kids in hospitals, uh, can be very intimidated by having to go inside of an MRI machine. So this guy thought he's a chemical technician at the, at the Lego group. And he thought, you know what? If I could like, there's a hospital, local hospital here. What if I make a little toy? MRI and I'll take it to the hospital and they can use it with the kids that are going to be going into this thing to show like, Oh, this is how, here's the minifigure. This is you and you'll be, and this is how it'll work. The response to this one that he made was so fantastic that basically Lego said, okay, we're going to make these things now. 
and we're going to distribute them around the planet to any hospital that wants it because the effect was so positive on the kids. So now there's, they've donated 600 of these Lego MRI scanners to hospitals worldwide. And it helps kids cope with that weird, you know, uncertainty mm-hmm. of what's going to be going into the, into the thing. So Eric Ullerlin Stair, chemical technician at Lego Group said, I'm extremely proud of this project and the positive impact it's already had. I've seen firsthand how children have responded to these models, making them feel more relaxed and turning an often highly stressful experience into a positive, playful one. For making a few Lego MRI models with other Lego employees in our free time, it's amazing to see the project now being rolled out more broadly. I just read this and it just made me smile. It was one of those things. It was so cool because, you know, being in play mode for a child motivates, you know, natural curiosity and and sort of an openness to try new things. And so if you reframe this experience of being put into this MRI machine as, hey, this is like a fun adventure, because check out, you're going to be in this, you know, it's like a spaceship or whatever you want to think about it. Uh, it just, the kids get sort of excited and much more, much more at ease with the whole process, which I think is just really cool. The models are, they got about 500 pieces. There's 13 centimeters wide, 25 and a half centimeters long and about 10 and a half centimeters high. So it's a decent sized thing. It comes in pieces. So you can kind of pull sections of it out to describe what's happening inside of it. And the people at Lego will pre-build them and send them out to hospitals. So there's, so if, if, if the, you know, people in the hospitals don't want to actually spend time building them, they don't have to. Mm-hmm. They've also developed these training videos to accompany the model. Uh, it helps sort of the medical staff, you know, guide the kids through the process of what the MRI scan is going to be like. And then it, uh, you know, it helps them have their sort of social and emotional learning through a play setting. It's really, really cool. And the, uh, all of this is available free of charge to any hospital that wants to, wants to use it and, uh, use it with their kids. And if that wasn't enough of a reason to just love Lego, recently they had another series of, of, uh, you know, they have all these different sets. So there's like, you know, the Harry Potter and the Star Wars and all kinds of, well, they had one set that was called Lego Friends. And Lego Friends, uh, it's originally was designed for young girls, but they sort of relaunched it uh, a little while ago. And they have characters that have uh, the little minifigures in it that have a range of disabilities, some visible and some invisible. And just recently they introduced a new character named Autumn, and she's she's missing an arm. She was inspired by a girl who, with a limb difference who wrote into Lego saying, hey, it'd be really nice to see a figure that looks like me. And Lego was like, hey, that's a great idea. So Autumn has, you can uh, use prosthetics with Autumn. And it's not like that's her defining characteristic. It just happens to be Autumn uh, is, is, has a limb difference. It's really, really cool and really sweet. And just like, okay, it's just, this is another character that we have. And then on top of that, in Lego City, which is another set that they have, one of their regular minifigures that's in there has a little hearing aid. And there's no like, it's not like it's, ooh, this is, you know, deaf Deaf Lego or something. Yeah, Yeah, you know, it's just like this character just has a hearing aid. That's all. It's just, yeah. And it's like, it's not a big deal. And it's just, this is, this is what that character, that's the character's trait. And the same way that we don't say like, hey, this is, you know, blue pants Fred. It's, uh, just, it's just a character trait and it's, it's just so sweet. And I think it's so nice to be able for different, uh, for kids to be able to see themselves inside these toys. And it's an analog real world project. And it's a right? real world analog yeah. project. Yeah. No yeah. Computer required. Huzzah, 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 huzzah. More so it just, I, you know, you think you love Lego and you just love Lego even more. I bet you that the benefits of that would not be limited to children. You know, in terms oh, of- oh, for sure. I, I yeah, I agree with that. Absolutely. I know plenty of adults who enjoy Lego. I mean, let alone teens or yeah, anyone going into it, you know, people with claustrophobia issues or whatever, mm-hmm. just to be like, hey, this is what's happening. I just, I just want one just to have one just to make it. Cause like, who wouldn't want a Lego MRI machine? That's like amazing, right? Next it's to the- a puzzle. It's a 3D puzzle. Yeah. Really what it is. Next to your X Wing fighter and your Harry Potter castle, you have a MRI machine. Are they for sale for the public or only gifted? They're them? not for sale for the public, so they're just making them. But I, I, I would bet at some point they will be. Yeah, they're just making them sort of custom for these for these uh, hospitals and stuff. But I'm sure over time people will like because again, who wouldn't want that? It's just the coolest thing. All right, thanks, George. Evan, let me ask you a question: Is the Mayo Clinic 
a reliable source of medical information. Sometimes. I think that's a fair answer. Sure. Uh, yeah, the Mayo Clinic. I, I would say it's world famous, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. That's, Absolutely. that's not a stretch. No, it's a world, it's a world class, world famous institution. You know where I was first introduced to the Mayo Clinic or learned uh, about airplane. It? airplane. Yes, airplane. I'm on five. Two, two yeah, calls. Com- yep, two calls coming <laughs> at the same time for the captain. I'm on five. Hold the mail, Doctor Han. I'm on five. Hold the mail. Comedy gold. And that was it. Mayo Clinic in my brain. But when when you see an article pop up, like I did in my feed last week about Reiki. And it's from the Mayo Clinic Press. I don't think there's anything really comical about that. Here's the title of the article. This is from uh, pu- this is put up from Mayo, Cl- Mayo Clinic Press. They ran this last week. Title: My journey from energy work skeptic to Reiki practitioner. As a nurse and a massage therapist, I was skeptical of the purported benefits of Reiki, but researching the practice and trying it myself changed my mind. That's the subtitle. I hate everything about this. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? I mean, it's, like, it's, like, it's right there. It encapsulates uh, grumble, like, grumble, so grumble. many problems. Nothing like getting your own opinions and feelings in the way of your profession, right? The fellow's name is Kenneth Ruth. And I'll read a couple. I pulled out a few things from his article that I'll share with you. For the majority of my 22-year career as a massage therapist and then as a registered nurse, I would scoff at therapies such as Reiki that fell under the umbrella of energy work. My preferred massage techniques were deep tissue, allowed me to work with things that I could physically feel, knots, muscle, tension. The idea that there is energy flowing all around and through us seemed silly to me. Over the past several years, however, my resistance slowly and incrementally softened. I found myself meditating regularly, exploring things like vibrational therapy and reading books about energy centers called chakras. Then one day, I figured it was time to turn my attention to Reiki to see if there was anything to it. Now I'm an enthusiastic Reiki practitioner who has seen and experienced the benefits firsthand. Reiki is usually translated as universal life force energy. It's administered by a trained practitioner through gentle touch. It's safe for all ages and works in harmony with standard medical care and other therapeutic techniques. I empathize with some people's reluctance to buy into the idea. I myself dismissed it for many years of practice. But if you find yourself open to receiving it, Reiki may have a positive effect on you as well. Those are the highlights. It's all propaganda. Oh, my gosh. First of all, he was never a skeptic. He was dismissive, (laughs) maybe. But the attitude that he described is not what I would consider skepticism. Oh, my gosh. I mean, really, there's so much... His his definition of Reiki or, you know, for, for what it is, it's it's lousy. Uh, here's an alternative definition. This is courtesy of Jonathan Jerry from McGill University in Canada, who's in their uh, science communication department. Reiki is a Japanese technique whose adherents say promotes healing. It posits some sort of life force energy that, when low, makes us sick. Through hand placement above and on the client's body, a Reiki master believes they are channeling their God's energy to assist with the healing uh, of the client. Yeah. So in other words, a Reiki practitioner uses hand waving and other semantics to try and lure the recipient into a state of relaxation so that whatever actual treatment is applied, the practitioner can trick themselves and their patient into believing that Reiki, that kabuki dance, played a role in their recovery. And on some level, it's basically faith healing. Yeah, I mean, if you think the right? energies come from God, then that's faith healing. Uh, absolute, absolutely, yeah, right. No, I, no doubt about it. I don't know how you can you can't separate the two. It's a laying on of hands. I mean, you have you have to have it. Okay, are there scientific studies of Reiki? Yep, and just about all the papers testing Reiki are teachable encapsulations of bad science. This is also from uh, McGill University. Uh, as they continue, uh, these papers often involve a single Reiki session, no follow up. They test small groups. It leads to noisy data that can look positive by chance alone. Some test Reiki on rats with implantable telemetric transmitters and measure so many things that one of them is bound to yield some favorable signal. All noise, right? No, no, no meat there. Yeah. So, I mean, and look, if you were to read about this, something like this in the Journal of what? Complementary and Alternative Medicine. You know, or amazing tales, or something, right? But this is the Mayo Clinic promoting amazing tales. Reiki. I mean, is it? They're not some small time quack outfit. In case you're not familiar with the Mayo Clinic, here's a few facts about them. This is from, this is right from their website, opening paragraph. The Mayo Clinic is the largest integrated not for profit medical group practice in the world. 
We're building the future where one of the best possible where, where one where the best possible care is available to everyone and more people can heal at home. Our relentless research turns into earlier diagnoses and new cures. That's how we inspire hope in all who need it most. Right. Our unwavering drive to create better medical care has earned Mayo Clinic top rankings from high uh, for high quality patient care more than any other healthcare organization. The Mayo Clinic has no, more number one rankings than any other hospital in the United States. And that's uh, from U.S. News and World Report 2023-2024. Uh, yeah, the Mayo Clinic, is, it's got a huge footprint in the American medical system. It has three primary locations in three states, Minnesota, Florida, and Arizona. Plus, they have affiliated hospitals in several other states in the United States. The uh, company as a whole, if you want to call it that, they employ 76,000 people. About 7,300 of them are physicians and scientists, and another 3,000 of them are full-time research personnel. Uh, their board of trustees is mostly filled by MDs and PhDs. Okay, so why is an iconic institution like Mayo Clinic allowing an article like this to run on their official publication? Mayo Clinic does this. This is this is their mm -hmm. blind spot. And I don't, again, I don't know. I don't have any inside information, but I know that – they basically turn a gullible eye towards anything alternative. I think I'd say they're reliable when it comes to mainstream scientific scientific medicine. And then it's like, why do good news outlets have fluff pseudoscientific news? Because they just treat it differently. It's like, oh, this guy's an expert? Okay, he could talk about it. You know, and nobody else cares about it. Uh, it's complete dereliction of duty. It's a, it's a complete blind spot on their part. They should be ashamed of themselves. They are failing their reputation, their institution, their patients, everything, their profession. It's just horrible. Uh, What's the motivation, though, do you think? Is it, is it to, a question to of be, getting – I don't know, marketing, to be open, to seem – I don't know. To seem balanced, to yeah, seem that so. kind of a thing? Or is it more like just they know that that, that that kind of story will drive a certain amount of views? I think it depends or, on who you're talking about. You're talking about to like the PR people? Yeah, they think – I don't know. That's why I'm wondering because it seems like there's – I mean there's going to be some statistical noise with an organization that's that that yeah. that's large. But this is know. a systemic problem with the mayor. Is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been happening for many years. I know that several – uh, of the authors at Science Based Medicine have, have mentioned this and other things like it regarding what's coming yeah. out of the Mayo Clinic since oh gosh I saw articles back as far as 2008 you yeah. were talking about and, and what and what is their justification do they ever address it do they say like we think this is a valuable part of the methodology we need to talk about or is it just we don't talk about that or or whatever because. Yeah, there's got to be some rush. Never out. seems to be a, a, a satisfying answer. Yeah, I've never gotten yeah. a satisfying answer. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. that's a shame, man. No, it is a shame. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah. You know, again, you know, th this is sort of implicit in everything we're saying, but there, no one has ever been able to demonstrate over the last couple of a hundred years that anything like a life force exists. This is a pre-scientific idea. It was always a placeholder of our own ignorance, which I love that term, but that's what it was. It was like yep. whatever we didn't know how you know biologically how how things function, oh, some kind of mysterious force must be doing that. And then eventually we just explained everything to the point that there was nothing left for the life force to do. And there have been attempts, whether or not it was done under the banner of Reiki or not, to, to, to demonstrate the existence of a life force. They've all failed. It doesn't exist. There's no reason to think that it exists. And whatever evidence we have shows that it does not exist. So this is the, the entire premise of Reiki is pseudoscience. And all those studies that you point to, Evan, in addition to being terrible clinical studies – they never address the core question, right? They assume that life energy exists, et cetera. They, they never Ugh. actually ask the only important question, and that is, are our premises real? And mm -hmm. so, of course, it, everything that flows from a false premise is worthless, right? It's false. So, yep. yeah. It's just, That's right. It's the source. <laughs> exactly. But why, again, like, so, so we've got... MDs that are on the board of this Mayo Clinic. Now, uh, if you were to ask them individually, I would, I would hope, I would assume that they would all say that Shruggies. Reiki is nonsense. Shruggy. So, right? so, so, so yes. Yeah, so they, is this, they, they this... don't know. So they just don't know. They don't care. They don't know. This is my mm. experience with yeah. with people who are not steeped in you know the pseudoscience and the modern. Because that's the more interesting. Same problems at Yale. 
And this is not this is not just Mayo Clinic, Yale, Duke, John Hop, Johns Hopkins. A lot of these institutions have these kinds of issues. Right. That's the more interesting topic, I think, than whether or not Reiki's real. Like we all we all understand Reiki's not real, but like what, what how is this slipping through? And and there must be some internalized justification. So there's, like, you know what? We're going to bring more eyes to our website, and we will be able to help them with these other things that we no, do, which no, are no, no. legit. It's not. It's that, nothing that's like not that, that, right? <laughs> right. It, what, I don't know. That would make no, sense. No, that's that's a, that's a reasonable hypothesis that hasn't been my experience. What I what I experience yeah. is there's a few true believers driving the whole thing, and mm. no one else gives a shit. That's what it is. Wow. Because everybody's too busy kind of doing their own It's thing. whatever. It's like, it's oh, this is like touchy-feely, fluffy stuff. Okay, fine. You know, they think it's harmless. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's not a dereliction yeah. in terms total. of Total. It's a total dereliction. Yeah. Oh, God. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the board of trustees are supposed to be protecting this, the, the institution from this kind Here's the other thing, George. Whenever you get in front of one of them and explain to them what's going on, they're scandalized because they, they had no idea. You know, oh, like, interesting. I'm shocked, shocked okay. that this is going on, but <laughs> right, <laughs> but it's like really explaining shocked. homeopathy to someone that uses it, like, and they go, "Really? That's what it is?" Yeah. Well, yeah. I've explained homeopathy to professionals and other people sure. who didn't know what it was, and the almost universal reaction is that they don't believe me. Mm, they right. say it, <laughs> yeah. it, it yeah. can't be that because right. that's stupid. Right. It can't it's be. So it can't be that right? stupid. Yeah. It can't be. Wow. I'm like, well, it is. And look it up. And then if they yeah. if they bother to do it, they then they usually say it's worse than you said. And I've had that. I've been in a meeting mm. with other professionals talking about some alternative medicine crap that was happening. And I said, you know, I was trying to point out to them exactly what like what was being claimed. They were making excuses and they were shrugging it off. And then one guy actually looked at it. And again, he was like, first he was scandalized, and then he said, it's actually worse than what you were saying. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. well, what, look at it fucking next yeah. time, you know? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just – because th- th- they just think it's not worth their time. Mm-hmm. It's just touchy-feely fluff we don't have to worry about. It's like, you know, do, do the serious editors at the New York Times really scrutinize, like, the fluff pieces about the dog the dog show? No, because it's, it's, that's the fluff – Dog show pieces, right? The problem yeah, is that's, is that yeah. when those pieces get st- deal with pseudoscience, right? Then, then then that's one of the avenues by which pseudoscience slips into mainstream media through the not serious journalism pages. Right, right? it gets legitimized. And this yeah. is the same thing. It's like, yeah. and I and, and I have to wonder if these institutions did their job and kept that stuff out of there. Would someone like this massage therapist? eventually slowly over time find his way to become a reiki practitioner i got to wonder if that would have been his his the, the course that he took maybe not uh, this, i don't know this guy sounds gullible from the get go to be honest with you that's my reading of, okay of, but still of what he his description of his own you know history deep tissue massage is a little dubious too you know oh, yeah, depending on exactly what he's referring yeah. to there he didn't say rolfing but no uh, it didn't say rolfing but it's say say it depends on what they're what they're actually talking about well everyone we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about our sponsor this week Vessi shoes so since i got my Vessi shoes i got the weekend sneakers and they're just wicked comfortable like they they're a sneaker, but they're so comfortable. They're they're like a slipper. That's basically why I made that decision. You know, I just want to keep them clean in the house, but they're awesome. These shoes are super comfortable. You know, guys, I really love the Chelsea style that I that I got. I love how it just slips on. I really, really don't have the patience anymore to tie my shoes every damn time <laughs> I put them on. There's, I love the removable insoles. You can put whatever you know insoles that you want to use, and the insole just comes right out, no problem. And it's light and breathable, and they're designed to keep your feet dry and comfortable in any weather, even crazy rain, with their patented waterproof Dymatex material. So embrace the urban landscape with Vessi's all-weather shoes. Visit Vessi.com slash SGU now to discover footwear that's as functional as it is fashionable. Get 15% off your first purchase at Vessi.com slash SGU. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. All right, Bob, tell us about the Circular Collider. What's that? Yes, CERN has released an interim report offering hints of the potential successor to its world-famous LHC, which we've talked about many times on the show, Large Hadron Collider. It's a behemoth. It's called the FCC, or Future Circular Collider. Uh, So what might this atom smasher of all atom smashers do? 
When might it do it? And is it even a good idea? All right, let's see here. So first of all, if you're still fuzzy about what an atom smasher is, or more accurately, particle accelerator, um, at a high level, they accelerate subatomic particles like protons to near the speed of light, smash them together, and see what comes out. Uh, the hope, of course, is that the new particles and radiations that emerge can finally resolve these you know, amazingly fascinating, frustrating mysteries that are still they still abound about the building blocks of the, of our universe. Um, so that's that's the hope. So the LHC, if you remember back in 2012, famously detected the Higgs boson, but since then has not made any of the big discoveries that were that were hoped for, especially discoveries that point to physics beyond our standard models predictions, like what like what dark matter or dark energy is, for example. You know, it's only 95% of the friggin' universe. We don't know what it is. It'd be nice if we had something to actually investigate that. So how might the future circular collider be better able to do this? Why, why would this one be better than the LHC? Well, first, first off, in this case, as in meatballs, bigger is definitely better. Uh, the, the LHC is located at the European Org- Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, near Geneva. Uh, so the LHC is 16.5 miles long, 27 kilometers. The proposed future circular collider is 57 miles or 91 kilometers long and 200 meters underground. It's way deep in there. So this is a big boy, 57 miles around opposed to 16 and a half miles. Um, yeah, big, big boy. Uh, in, in many ways, the, uh, the LHC cost four, 4.75 billion USD, 3.75 uh, billion euros to build. Um, and that's just to build it. That's not even the operating price. But still, that's a lot of money. The FCC, um, they they think it's going to cost 17 billion USD uh, and 12 billion euros uh, to build, and with maybe with an operating cost of potentially a billion a year. Um, so it, that's a lot of money. Oh my God, it's so many billions of dollars in terms of beam beam energy. Uh, this guy is a bit is big. The LHC had 14. They finally got up to 14 trillion electron volts, 14 tera electron volts. Um, that is that is a, an amazing number. It's the most powerful particle collider in the world. It, it accelerates particles 99.999999% of the speed of light. So these, these protons are going amazingly fast, 11 kilometers per hour slower than the speed of light. I mean, it's just like just a tick under the speed of light, amazingly fast. But that's 14 tera electron volts. The FCC... Uh, should be able to generate a hundred tera electron volts of beam beam energy. That is incredible, far beyond anything, um, th- anything that 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 exists now. Um, I I couldn't run the numbers on that one, but it's you know even more, even closer to the speed of light. Maybe only a couple of kilometers per hour slower than the speed of light. Um, so uh, yeah, will am- the, amazing. Will this collider go up to eleven? Uh-huh. That's what you did there. Um, so a, a, that's a seven-fold increase. Huh? I have no answer for that. Okay. A seven-fold increase in beam energy. So amazing. That thing, it would be the most amazing piece of technology the world has ever seen. So what is, what's the future of the FCC? Is this going to happen? Well, right now, we're in the feasibility studies fa- stage. In 2028, if it's going to get greenlit, it's, it'll get greenlit around that time. And then if, if, all, if all goes to plan in 2045, we may see phase one complete, which is really, I mean, it's just like electrons and positrons smashing together. Um, you know, nothing too amazing there. It would, it would take, though, until the 2070s to get it up to full power, 100 tera electron volts, smashing together positrons and heavy ions. So that's the 2070s. Fabiola Gionotti, CERN's director general, said, the FCC will not only be a wonderful instrument to improve our understanding of the fundamental laws of physics and nature, it will also be a driver of innovation because we will need new advanced technologies from cryogenics, superconducting magnets, vacuum technologies, detectors, instrumentation, technologies with a potentially huge impact on our society and a huge so- socioeconomic benefit. So, um, so what do I think of this? First off, I will be 107 freaking years old when it's totally finished. Mm-hmm. So that really pisses me off right out of the gate. That really pisses me off. 107. That's a long time for me to wait, but I will wait if need yeah, be. Yeah, you'll look 92. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, George. I love you so much. Okay. <laughs> I agree. I, so I agree with the second half of Fabiola Gionati's quote. Uh, 
when she said that the enabling technologies of the FCC, like the new superconductors and, and the, the detectors and instrumentation, will have a huge impact on industries and society as a whole. Absolutely. Uh, th- these would be cutting edge uh, new te- you know, technologies, far superior to what we have today, could have a huge impact. But when she says that the FCC will improve our understanding of the fundamental laws of physics, eh, I can't really agree with the enthusiasm that I would love to, that I wish I could. And a lot of real physicists, physicists out there, I think, would agree with me. They're, they're just not convinced, uh, and, and they contend that this is more marketing and money-raising hype than anything else, actually. Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's, uh, it's a little frustrating when you dig, dig d- deep into this. It's like, you know, it's really, there's really no good reason to think uh, that, there were, that there's going to be a lot of discoveries, even at this level, the FCC doesn't seem to be as obviously of, of a good idea as the LHC was, right? Because when the LHC is, they they had theories saying, "Look, it, we will probably more than likely discover the final, you know, fundamental particle that's not been found by the standard model, the Higgs boson and the Higgs field, evidence of the Higgs field." So the LHC made a lot of sense, but I, I think it's good to ask, as my friend Walt does in our endless work meetings. Five days a week, he often asks, is the juice worth the squeeze? This guy has mm-hmm. the greatest expressions. So uh, unfortunately, the answer to that, it seems like no, the juice is not worth the squeeze. It, it looks like the ROI for the FCC, SUX, basically. That's, that's my opinion there. Uh, Professor, LOL. Prof- yeah, good one, Steve. <laughs> Professor uh, Sir David King is a former UK government chief scientific advisor. Told the BBC News uh, that he believes spending 12 billion euro on the project would be reckless. Um, but he, he's, he's being kind. Sabine Hassenfelder, uh, she's a theoretical physicist at Munich, the, the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy. She's probably the most outspoken critic um, against the, the future circular collider that I've come across so far. Uh, she says that the FCC would be more expensive than both the LHC and LIGO, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, talked about it. Amazing technology, amazing new window into space. Um, she says that the FCC would be more expensive than both of those. And with less discovery potential, she says, it would be at the present state of knowledge and technology, not, it would not give a good return on investment. There are presently better avenues to pursue than high energy physics. So yeah, so that's a, that's a hell of a quote there. So, but so Director Giannotti has addressed this kind of, and she says things like, it's true that at the moment we do not have a clear theoretical guidance on what we should look for. She does, she has said that, but she still says, on the other hand, she says things like the FCC is needed because the discovery of these dark particles, and she's referring to dark matter, dark energy, would lead to new, a new, more complete theory of how the universe works. And it, that's really, she really shouldn't be saying that. Um, in my in my opinion, Hassenfelder thinks that CERN is intentionally misleading the public when it says things like this. When he, it even implies that this new collider, you know, will will likely discover, you know, what dark energy and dark matter is. There's really no theoretical underpinning to that statement. Hassenfelder gets even more brutal when she says the truth is that the the most likely thing such a machine would do is just make better measurements of some constants in the standard model, and that's it. Let me read that again. She says, the most likely thing this amazing 100 tera electron volt, 56 mile machine, the most likely thing it's, it would be able to do is make better measurements of some constants. Um, and that's it, she says. She says, I do not think the societal relevance is high enough to justify just a big, such a big investment. And that's the bottom line right there. And, but she, she's not even done. She continues. Listen to this one. She said, I fear the funding, that funding such an experiment will mean a lot of smart people will waste their time on research that will not lead to any progress. The LHC had a good motivation. The FCC has not. The particle physicists have, co- have to accept that their time is over. This is the age of quantum physics. Wow. wow what, a, what a final it. sentence that was. Steve, mm-hmm. you hear that? Yeah, but there's uh, got to be some you know, contradictory opinions there. I mean, there, there is. There is. But, uh, but uh, I'm seeing a lot of people – you know, there's a good number of scientists that, that agree that, that – that, I mean, and this news has recently come out. You know, so there's not a lot of stuff yet out there that, that's really going off about the FCC – 
But uh, but this makes sense, and this is kind of w- the way I've been leaning now for a lot of years. Is that there really is no you know as much as I want to find new physics beyond the standard model, there's nothing coming out of the LHC, and there's there's no there's there's nothing out there that makes anyone really anyone think that yes. The um, this new collider will find this. You know, we had there was a confidence with the LHC. We're going to find the Higgs. There, there's no confidence for for something at, at this size. I don't agree with Hassenfelder necessarily when she says the particle physicist time is over, but I uh, I do agree that entering this new realm, this new realm of expensive mega colliders like the FCC is probably not worth it not for that kind of money, without more theoretical guidance instead of mainly just crossed fingers, right? Because I think that it's, that's pretty much what they have right now is these just crossed fingers and some, maybe some hints here and there, but no real, no theoretical underpinning that would, that would justify you know, $17 billion. And a lot of, Steve, a lot of American scientists are steering away from these mega colliders like the FCC, and they're, they're trying to focus um, more on something that is more reasonable, like, for example, muon colliders. Have you ever heard of muon colliders? These are these are untested, so we've never. N- there hasn't been one that's been built yet, but uh, they seem to have a, a decent amount of promise at a really good sticker price, right? Since muons are are fundamental particles, unlike protons, they could be run using less energy and be a lot cheaper. So with a with a muon collider, you can get a ten tera electron volt. Uh, collider that would be roughly equivalent in a lot of ways to the 100 tera electron volt proton collider at the FCC, but it would be much much cheaper. So I think it'd be it'd be better to to, to funnel you know our limited research funds to something like that instead of just going hog wild and just jumping into a to a collider that that like Hassenfelder said it could waste a lot of smart people's time for many decades without really much of a a perceived return on investment. It could be really Almost, it could be like the LHC right now, where there's really nothing really f- new coming out that points to new physics. Bob, what, what, what was the name of that of the uh, organization, the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy? What was it? Yeah, so this was uh, Sabine Hassenfelder. She was the, the big critic of uh, of this FCC. She's a theoretical physicist at the Munich Center for Mathematical Philosophy. Can you can you imagine? the banger Christmas parties they must have there. <laughs> I mean, just like, think about it. Like, oh my gosh, that's so exciting. She has yeah. a popular YouTube series, George. I've watched a ton of her videos. Yeah, she's good, she Steve, does a right? Deep dive on, yeah, on a lot of physics topics. She's I think good. On, you know, I, I do, she makes me wonder, though, if some of her opinions are a little outside the mainstream. Um, but for a lot of things, like, I do find her spot on. She's a little cynical at times, too, I find. Yeah. Her. Yeah, uh, but still, I think is great introductory to a lot of a, a lot of the things, German? a lot of the things that we talk about, you know. But yeah, I mean, I think just the whole like we don't know until we look kind of thing is valid, but not for seventeen billion. That's exactly. the, the price tag is the thing that changes the calculus. The exactly. Thing is, Bob, I wonder, like, in twenty years, will we have? new technology that will accomplish the same thing a lot cheaper, you know? People talk of linear colliders, Steve. They talk instead of circular, they have linear colliders. But, uh, you know, even advanced linear colliders don't necessarily look that great cause, because you just can't build up, you know, the, the speed as easily, you know? We, well, Bob, I'm talking it, about more like, they were talking about 50 years, right, for, before right. it's fully operational. I mean, what kind of superconducting magnets are we going to have at that time or whatever? I just think that... If it's for if it's going to have to be that big at that price tag, waiting twenty years, it's like it's like sending the slow ship and then the fast ship that leaves later catches up. Yeah, to it. it might yeah. be the same thing. Like maybe something we design twenty years from now might actually get done faster than this thing. I don't know. There's well, a, the thing is, though, you're, in order to even create the FCC, you would need the, the, those new and 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 mega awesome you know, superconductors and things like that, and and vacuum chambers, and so it would it might take it might require that. You know, uh, many billions to to motivate people to cr- to create them, and and but I think you can get motivation to create things like that for for other things. I mean, like like fusion power, you know, it requires them as, as well. So uh, we don't necessarily need to throw seventeen billion just for those things that we're that we could probably develop elsewhere. All right, Jay, it's who's that noisy time? All right, guys, I have the noisy from last week, and then when we get through it, I'm going to play you a a sister file to it to explain the whole thing. This is what we call the enhanced version. (laughs) 
I um I really like this noisy. <laughs> wow. Very cool. And it definitely Steve and I t- said last week it reminds us of uh the Yeah, something the, the, turrets. the little drone the turrets and in, in portal. <laughs> Very oh. similar voice. Oh, okay. I had a lot of people guess on this one, and there were a lot of good information coming in from people, so I'll try to tell you as we go. So the first person um, is Marcus Miller, and Marcus said, Hi, SGU, long-time listener, first time, who's that noisy guesser? And this week's Who's That Noisy? The Mimicking Cactus toy that's all over TikTok, right? So this is a toy that you may have seen. It's a uh, it's cactus. It looks like a plush cactus that's in a planter. And then when it hears music... It plays it back at a different pitch, but the cactus moves its body, you know, like it's kind of like the yeah. two arms coming out. Um, and it kind of, you know, it distorts what your the noises that it hears, but it's fun. And unfortunately, there's a lot of videos of uh, people scaring babies with this. I don't know why they think it's funny, um, <laughs> but that's what's happening. Don't scare anyway, babies. So that is incorrect, but that was a fun guess. Another listener named Mark Entel said, I know the song, Stagger Lee. Uh, he's correct, right? So that's another layer to this. That's that that tune that you were hearing is an old song called Stagger Lee. It's an old blo- uh, old blues song. So he, um, Mark continues. As to the technical side, it sounds very digital to me. But beyond that, getting out on a limb here, my actual guess: this is some extra old recording that was too damaged to play, but some genius lunatics figured out a way to digitally capture it. <laughs> so thank you, Mark. That's not correct, but it's a wonderful guess. But I love genius lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say it. Okay, so we got another listener named Eric Wadsworth, and he said, it sounds like someone grabbed the first little audio clips from a bunch of spoken words, identified which tones they were nearest to, assigned them to those notes, then strung them together to make a song. But what spoken audio clip were they pulled from? Maybe an episode of the SGU. That's my guess. Uh, not correct, but I I give you an A for effort because that was a very specific guess right. that you made, and I, and it, I I follow along since I know exactly what's going on here. I do follow what you're saying, and it was it was very good, very interesting. My friend Visto Tutti wrote in again, <laughs> again. You know he doesn't ever send me an email like Hey Jay, how you doing? It's all business with this guy, right? It's always like. <laughs> Very serious with the who's that noisy. So he says, this noisy sounds like the phonetic alphabet fed through autotune. I'm not sure why anyone would do that, but it Mm -hmm. sounds cool. And I thought this was a provocative guess because there is kind of an autotune vibe going on a little bit to a certain degree. Yeah. And it is a good guess. But now I have a winner. And I was very surprised that someone nailed this simply because I probably would never have been able to guess it. So anyway... This is a listener um, named Sharp, and Sharp says, I'm almost certain I know what this week's noisy is. It's a guitar or maybe a banjo after being processed by a speech enhancement filter. I think maybe made by Adobe, although I don't know the Uh, name. What? All right. So to cut to the chase here, again, the listener that that sent it in is named Stefan Walker. And here's what he said, and then we'll talk a little bit about this. He said, hello, Jay. I accidentally created this Who's That Noisy when I was experimenting with cleaning up the 1928 recording of Stack O'Lee Blues by Mississippi uh, John Hurt. I ran the recording through Adobe Podcast AI Speech Enhancer. The AI's attempt to make speech from the song's instrumental intro and noise artifacts resulted in what I thought was a pretty interesting noisy. So now I'm going to play you the original song, and then you'll hear what the AI did to it, trying to recognize it as speech. Now check this out. It's it's a wow. it's so interesting, right? It, it really grabs me. Um, yeah. I'm a sucker for good lyrics, so that's amazing. Mm-hmm. But you can, it, it also <laughs> has a syncopation. If you listen yeah. to it, there's a little yeah. bit of like a you know like a, some type of drumming syncopation thing happening with the voice, and it also creeps me out a little bit, right? It's got like that <laughs> almost. Valley. Right, it has an uncanny valley thing going on, and it just kind of reminds me that we are wow, in the uncanny age, valley with voice. Wow, you know we're we're here at the very beginning of the age of artificial intelligence, where it's starting to seep into our 
world in a visible way, right? Like it was been there for a while, but now we all know it and we're using it and, you know, it's in the tools that we're using and, and it's, it's, it's there and it's going to be there and it's going to get more and more powerful as time goes on. So I'm, I'm interested to see what happens, but man, this was a cool noisy. This I told- is like the reverse of what's, there's a, a, a composer from the late 20th century called Steve Reich. He was a New York uh, composer and he would take language recordings of just people speaking and he would find the melodies within because you, you speak with an inherent pitch and melody, mm-hmm. even though you don't realize it. So he would transcribe these things. So if someone would say, you know, I'm going to catch a train. I'm the da 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 And he would then assign it for instruments and he would have these pieces where you'd hear the original tape and then it would turn into the melody. And this is like going in the opposite direction, taking a melody and finding speech, but artificially yeah, through yeah, it. Yeah. Ah, right, so right. fascinating, man. Total flip coin. You know what I if wonder? You, you know how people can play a guitar so that it makes words? Yes. You yeah. do Steve that to be able to do stuff, that. Yeah. Do that and run it through the same right. processing. Yeah. All right. Mama, stuff like yeah, that. All right, so somebody take can. somebody take Steve Vai um, doing that and run it through. Uh, so let me give you what it is. It's the Adobe Podcast AI Speech Enhancer. Let's see if someone wow. can do it for us, and uh, we'll see what that sounds like. I mean, it should work, right? Because you could, you could identify the words that he's playing even without knowing beforehand. What yeah, but I wonder how are, good right? – my, my question is I wonder how good it will get. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, yeah you are starting with uh, something that's trying to sound like speech as it is. But it, it, they're, both of those phenomena are related because it's – that's how our brain works. It takes ambiguous auditory stimuli and makes the best word match it can, mm-hmm. right? And it's it's yeah. fitting it to a limited number of phonemes. What's that called? The EVP, electric vocal phenomenon. Well, that, well, that's a pareidolia. Where people, our brains will will even make um, speech out of out of white noise, you know, out, right. of, out of background noise. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, I have a new noisy for you this week. This was sent in by a listener named Justin Fisher. Justin has sent in uh, several noisies to me, which I've used. So th- thank you, Justin. He, he really gets it. He, he hits it right on the head with these. So check this one out. Kind of wacky, right? <laughs> you guys think you know what this week's noisy is or you heard something cool. You really just got to take the minute to send it to me because it makes the show that much better. You can contribute by sending me cool noises. So we have stuff going on, Steve. Mm-hmm. So first and foremost, we have an extravaganza that's going to be happening in Dallas. It'll be happening on April 6th in Dallas. Um, you can go to our website. There's a button on there um, that will take you to the tickets and – if you are interested, how about this? We're going to be doing an extravaganza in Chicago. <gasps> Yay. That Can't wait. Chicago. Windy City. Finally. That will happen Woo-hoo. on August 17th, Saturday, August 17th in Chicago. Finally, um, Chicago. First yeah. time. We're yep. going to go do some skeptical work there in Chicago we'll, for you. We'll get a brat <laughs> while we're there. <laughs> so we, do a little uh, bit of that extravaganza. We've been working, you know, we're working on our, you know, yearly schedule, and this was something that we squeezed in. Uh, we have a really busy year this year. As you know, our thousandth episode is going to happen. And guess yep. what, guys? That juice is worth that squeeze. The thousandth <laughs> episode is going to happen on the Chicago trip, and we will Wait be a recording minute. that. No way. Not Wait. later. There's, there's no way that's going to happen. Are you then. saying the crowds in Chicago are going to share in our thousandth episode? If they want, they can come join us. So... I haven't been able to like lock in all the details because I'm, you know, we're, we're really talking about this. We're trying to figure out exactly what we want to do. We have a lot of good ideas. Uh, it it will be a venue that I'll pick in Chicago. It'll be on uh, Sunday the 18th. It's going to be an extended show, um, which means you know it's going to definitely be more than just a two hour podcast. We're going to do a lot of other stuff. Um, probably going to be bringing in virtual guests. And we really hope that you'll join us. I will be putting more information out. You know, hopefully by this time next week, I, I might even have the link to buy tickets for that. Whoa. Just giving you fair warning about that weekend. And we might have an event uh, that Friday, the 16th. Uh, at, you know, the day that we fly in, we were thinking that we might have a very, very small uh, gathering. Um, so we'll give you more details about that as well. But we have this stuff coming up. 
Now, there is Can one- you take a second to just think about the fact that you're going to be in a thousand episodes, guys? I mean, yeah. just just take a second to think. That's nuts, really. man. That's uh, pretty. Nice. I, can only, I can only remember eight. Eight of them. <laughs> so o- only Steve. Well, eight good ones, episode but, number eight. Only right. Steve has done a thousand episodes because right. all of us. Yeah. Um, but just it. as an entity, I mean, that's it's, yeah. And the fact that people can be part of down, that thousandth Jay. show live, that's amazing. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it is. It is amazing to think that we've been doing this for so long. I mean, George, it, even like from the day we met you, the amount of podcasting that yeah. we've all done collectively is huge. It just we just. Yeah. Are, very George, what, num- what number are you up to, George? You're, you're I'm at 852. Whoa, dude. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Damn, close, dude. nice. I'm, I'm always like, years, like you're there. 14 months behind you guys <laughs> yeah. or something. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's, I mean, and again, the fact that it's lined up with the with the Chicago trip and people can sit in the audience and have their brats and watch the thousand episode, it's amazing. I think it's just, <laughs> it's just brilliant. George, you're going to have to do the entire extravaganza in that act. I'm not going to not do this. I mean, from, from the air, from LaGuardia, from yeah. LaGuardia to, to the him. damn venue, I am talking like this. Nothing's going to stop me. LaGuardia. My mom's from Chicago. So like she awesome. has this little, little bit of that in her, in her really? voice. Really? Will yeah. she be at the show? So, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll get Gio's mom. She'll have a nice little homecoming. That'd be yeah. fun. Yeah, she grew up in Chicago, so. Aw. All right, thanks, Jay. Guys, a quick name, that logical fallacy. Uh, I got a, got a fun question. It's a little bit long. I'm going to read you through it, and th- so we'll see if you can identify the error that this SGU listener is making. Uh, they write, I don't think they put their name to the thing. They write, hi, SGU. I'm a longtime listener to the podcast and a longtime owner of your first book, but, and I'm afraid to admit this, just getting around to reading it, I just finished the short <sighs> section on the gambler's fallacy, the idea that if you flip heads five or 10 or 25 times in a row, tails is due, when in reality, every individual flip has its own 50-50 chance of being either heads or tails, which is not influenced by past events. I have always had a little trouble with this idea because while an individual flip absolutely does have an equal likelihood of landing heads or tails, if we consider an event to be 25 flips, Then he says, parenthetically, maybe this isn't allowed. Then the likelihood of 25 heads in a row is vanishingly small. And the likelihood of 12 to 14 heads, much, much higher. So if halfway through that event, you've got 12 heads, you would think that the likelihood of flipping tails at least a few times throughout the second half does, in fact, go up significantly. I think of this as in the line with the very well-established statistical phenomenon of regression to the mean. While outlier events and streaks are, are very much part of randomness, over time, those bumps and spikes tend to smooth out to show more or less the expected distribution. So I guess my question is, is there a conflict between the ideas of gambler's fallacy and regression to the mean? It goes on a little bit more, but I think that encapsulates the question. So what mistake is this guy making? Now, statistics is very counterintuitive, and and a lot of people have trouble like fully wrapping their head around these kinds of questions, so I totally get it. But I think he's making a pretty blatant logical error. In fact, committing the gambler's fallacy. So, we, 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 what do you what do you guys think? Yeah, I'm st- I'm stumped where it's not how it's not the gambler's fallacy. It is a gambler's fallacy. So, but he says here's the here's the key question: If you treat 25 flips as an event, and halfway through you have 12 heads, shouldn't you then be more likely to get tails so that it, so that the 25 flips regresses to the mean and balances out? Oh, because that 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 twelve doesn't know it's a twelve. Yeah, it doesn't know it's halfway through an event. It's relying on. It doesn't rely on prior information. Right. right. It, it, everything is discrete. Yes. Yeah. But I think that's both. Those things are are correct. Right. So each each flip is still independent. You're right, assuming it's a fair well, point. Glumping them together. It, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, no, they're not. They're not I, discrete. That you don't think that's part of the problem. I think you you can treat twenty five flips. As a statistical event, that's legitimate. Yeah, right. That's true. Yeah, but if you get one result doing it twenty-five times, if that's an event, I think the, yeah, over I the think course of several of those events, it would even out. So, so, so you're taking like a one piece. You're taking a, a, yeah. a you're 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 snipping one this one event as its own set of information, and it's kind of incomplete. You're kind of dancing around what I think is the core mistake that he's making. The problem comes when he says. So if halfway through that event, you, that's what you can't do. Oh, it's, it's like you, p-hacking. You can't thing. stop halfway through yeah. because yeah, now you you've split it up into two events. I knew it. Right? So that you have to consider them separately. You can't stop halfway through and consider the statistics so far. 
Does that make sense? It's, it, it, yes. it, is, it is like yes. p-hacking, Evan. You, you can't look at your data halfway through and then make... Declare victory uh, or declare right. a, 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 some final conclusion out of that. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, or in, independently analyze it or whatever. You can't do that. If you're saying we're going to flip the coin 25 times, if that's your event and that's what you say you're going to do, you have to flip the coin 25 times. And you have to consider them all together as one chunk. You, can't, you cannot then say you, you can't analyze where you are halfway through because now you've just divided it into two events. Right, so you're looking yeah. at the first twelve flips and the second twelve flips, or whatever, and you, you can't consider them now as one twenty-five flip chunk at when you're halfway through. Mm-hmm. But it, yeah. the, well, all the things you guys said were true. That's sort of just like a that derives from that problem, right? Of what, what right. of what he's doing. So is that a gambler's? Yeah, policy? it is because it, again, it's just another way of saying that the previous twelve flips somehow influence the next twelve flips right. because it knows, right. as you said, George, it doesn't know it's halfway through. That's right. why. That's why that's not legitimate. It's just its own thing. But th- and then then th- the regression to the mean is what screws people up because they think that regression to the mean seems like it knows the past, right? But it's but right. re- regression to the mean just means it's more likely. What, this is what regression to the mean is. In any series, if you are if if you deviate significantly from randomness, but by flukiness, by chance alone, it's likely to be followed by a sequence that's less that's more that's closer to randomness. So in his example, right, of twelve heads in a row, that's a fluke. It's 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 more likely that the next twelve flips will be closer to average, meaning they'll be half tails and half heads. So actually regression to the mean says the opposite of what he's saying. It says yeah. not that oh, it'll not, right. okay. not that it will be twelve tails, because that's also an outlier. But right. that or ten tails. Right, yeah. or ten like, tails. It's it's yeah. more likely that it'll be six to seven or you know, five to seven of each, you know. Right. Because um, the outlier was the previous. The outlier the previous was the bunch. previous twelve heads. Yeah. Exactly. But that screws people up because they think that the they they do that where they're looking at the but the whole sequence has to regress to the mean and I've already looked at the first half of it. It's like no, that doesn't work. That's in yeah. that's now separate. That's how they get you at the roulette wheel? Totally. Yeah. That's why it's they called. They put up that they put up that big electric board with the green numbers and the red numbers, yeah. and you see, oh my gosh, ten red numbers have shown up. Oh my gosh! Yeah, but no, you, it's, it's, you, let's it's ride due. the hot streak. It's due. It's due, yeah. or, or it's, it's hot. Due. If you can yeah. make it, yeah, it's a thing. That's it's it's one of the reasons you know it's pointless <laughs> because you could make it work either way. Right. Right. Yeah. All right, guys, let's move on with science or fiction. It's time for science or. Fiction. Each week I come up with three science news items or, or facts, two real, one fake, and then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake, and you guys can play along at home. There's only kind of a weak theme this week. It's not really a theme, but the items are all kind of similar in a way that you'll see. But there are three regular news items. Are you guys ready? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay, here we go. Item number one. A recent study shows that older adults are more vulnerable to first impressions of trustworthiness, even in the face of contradictory evidence. Item number two. A machine learning analysis correlating road features with accident frequency finds that the most predictive variable for high crash risk is the presence of distracting billboards and other advertisements. And item number three. Researchers find that short and simple corrective statements on social media help readers identify false information. Evan, go first. The first one about um, older adults more vulnerable to first impressions of trustworthiness, even in the face of contradictory evidence. Yeah, so I'll I'll paraphrase that. So basically what that means, if somebody seems trustworthy at first, they'll continue to trust them even when they do things that are not trustworthy, right? Oh, even in so the, the face first of impression rules, like a first impression, like dominates. Yes, they they don't correct their first impression with later evidence about that person not being trustworthy. Huh. I I don't know. Were we talking just offline about people as they get older come to better conclusions, even though it takes more time for them to get to those conclusions? Does that violate this? Uh, I'm trying to do a correlation here. I'm not sure it's a correct correlation. So therefore, I'm going to move on. 
about uh, machine learning analysis correlating road features with accident frequency, and it finds that the most predictive variable for high crash risk, the presence of distracting billboard billboards and other advertisements. Yeah, so they're looking at stretches oh of road, and they're saying how many accidents happen, like at what frequency on that stretch of road, and what are the features of that stretch of road. They look at a whole bunch of different variables and see which one correlates with high crash crash risk. Well, I mean, there's certainly a lot of data out there, you know, that to sift through is that's the conclusion that they that they reached. You know, I mean, well, you got what maybe decades worth, many decades worth of data you can go through. It's got to be a big set, most predictive variable uh, for high crash risk. I don't know about that one. The last one, short and simple corrective statements on social media help readers identify false information. Yeah, but how do they know that it's correct? What if the corrective statement is incorrect and it's not corrective or is it taken into account? Um, Steve, can this assumes that the corrective statement is truly a correct statement, right? In other words. So within the confines of this sentence, this is not saying anything. I'm not saying in this sentence anything about any other permutation. But yes, if, if there's false information online and someone – corrects it by saying this is wrong, right, whatever, then people reading that are more likely to identify the false information as false information. Uh, of these three, these are all very uh, um, hard to grasp in, in their own right uh, and come up with a correct one here. I don't have a good grasp for any of them, frankly. They're, but I have, to make a, I have to make some kind of guess. I yes, will say it is the... Three, this one, social media helping readers identify false information would therefore be the fiction. <sighs> okay. Bob? Yeah, I don't have much to say about the uh, older adults and first impressions. That's compared to younger adults, obviously. Yeah, not sure wh what's going on with that one. Let's look at the second one here. Um, yeah, the road features. I, I would think other things like like the um, how curvy the road is or or other things other than just – distracting billboards i mean also you know once you drive by a billboard a few times they don't change very often i mean how often how much would it be distracting once you've seen it already a million times um of course it could be drivers who haven't seen it but i i, I don't know it just doesn't strike me as, as right let's look at this third one social media i don't know this one could go absolutely either way i know that if i you know if i'm looking at a reddit post and and i'm kind of not sure what to think of the the original posts statement um and if somebody says oh yeah that's a fake that's that's computer generated it's not even real or whatever i could be swayed i think from people you know saying that oh yeah this is fake then then i immediately you know will leap i'll be closer you know to their point of view than if i was thinking that oh yeah this really did happen i don't know I, it can be persuasive i find it and of course usually I'll, I'll just do extra research if i really want to be sure but i could see how it could be persuasive but that that one can go either way cuz i think it's so counterintuitive you know what helps people in social social media world you know what could help them determine that news items are true or false it's so counterintuitive at times so, so i i guess uh, my best guess will be that the um the predictive variables for their high crash risk is not going to be billboard signs or advertising. It'll be probably something else. Uh, but Bob, if if I hear you correctly, therefore the fact that I chose the social media one, if I get that incorrect, you're not going to be disappointed in me. I No, I won't be. Nope. Understood. That mm -hmm. makes me feel better. <laughs> All right, Jay. <laughs> the first one about the older adults are more vulnerable to first impressions. I don't know. That's counterintuitive to me. I'm really leaning hard on that one as being the fiction. The second one about the machine learning analysis that took, took a look at high crash places. I mean, I would imagine that billboards, you know, I mean, we do look at them and, we, and if they have information on them, you know, we're looking at them for extended periods of time because they're big and you can read them from far away. So you're kind of like focusing on them for not just a couple of seconds, but it could be longer than that. So I, I think that one is science. Researchers uh, find that short and simple corrective statements on social media – I think that one is science as well. Yeah, I'm definitely going to go with the first one here about the um, the older people and first impressions. That's the fiction. Huh. All right, George, no help to you, man. They're all over the place. <laughs> all right, George. Oh, no, seriously. I mean, I think that they all seem kind of both very obvious. And then at the same time, that makes me think that they're not very obvious. So yeah, it's right. real, well done, Steve. Really, really well done. I would say that, that number one with the uh, adults 
relying on their first impression, despite what they may be shown at a later point. That feels really good. That feels really solid to me because that's kind of that stubbornness of, no, he's a nice guy. I, I know he's a, he's a lovely person. Regardless, as as their being as their bank account is being emptied by that same person they met, but but they had a nice shirt on when they met, so that that stays with them. <laughs> I think the the uh, the the accident one is the fake one because I bet it's something like it's not uh, billboards, but it's like confusing road signs or poorly lit areas or like that. That is more predictive of the high crash. Yeah, I- that that to me feels like the thing. And then the the again the research is finding that a simple correction. What what is it the the backlash syndrome or whatever that's called the feedback syndrome or like if you correct something on the internet the correction doesn't <laughs> reinforce like that feels like that should be wrong so I'm going to think that's right so in, in essence I think that the the machine learning uh, this, uh, with the cars and the accidents is the fiction okay all right George so you guys are spread Ooh, out choice. pretty good so I'm just going to take these in order I think Bob and I are together yeah yeah. Uh, a recent study yes. shows that older adults are more vulnerable to first impressions of trustworthiness, even in the face of contradictory evidence. Jay, you think this was this one is the fiction. Everyone else thinks this one is science. I guess the question is, do you think that with age, people get more wisdom and a little bit more savvy about these kind of social interactions? They think they or, do. Yeah, or is there something else going on? This one is science. Sorry, Jay. Okay. So yeah, and this really shows how vulnerable older people can be to cons. What they did was they used a standardized psychological test called the Iowa Gambling Task, which essentially you give people decks of cards and they that they flip over, and then the decks either can they're they're playing a game for virtual money and they're trying to make as much money as possible, and the decks could either the cards could make them win or lose either a little bit of money or a lot of money. So in one, and there are good decks and bad decks. There are decks that make them lose and decks that make them win, right? So their job is to figure out that which decks are good and to go with those decks. Now, uh-huh. they, what they did in this study was they paired that with basically an image of either a trustworthy-looking person or a not-so-trustworthy-looking <laughs> person, right, who was, who was giving them the deck, right? This is my deck, right? So they pair it. They pair, and they did it both ways. They paired a good deck with a trusty person and a bad deck with an untrustworthy-looking person, and then they flipped it and did a good deck with an untrustworthy-looking person and a, and a bad deck with a trustworthy-looking person. So the, one of the questions was, how influenced were people, again, sorting them into young adults and old adults, how influenced were they by the trustworthiness of the, of the image that they were shown? And everybody... Wow. was predisposed to the trustworthy person, right? They would favor those decks uh, initially. But the younger people would quickly learn which that decks were which decks were good and which decks were bad and would mm. then ignore whether or not the person looked trustworthy and go with the data. Whereas the older adults would stick with their initial impression and wouldn't correct based upon the new information about was the deck actually good or actually bad. And the longer the game went on, the greater the disparity between younger and older Whoa. adults. Mm. So in other words, the younger adults were Double learning better down. over time and the older adults were just not learning over time. They weren't oh, really boy. getting better. Really wrong. Yeah. Well, at, at least older adults aren't really in charge of our government. So we're, we're yeah, good. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So they have no sway. <laughs> the, then the question is neurologically why is this happening? We do know that people's executive function slows down as they get older. Uh, and so it could be that they're just, it, this is like, this takes a lot of brain power to, to manage these two variables at the same time. What should I trust this person and which deck is good or bad? And so that just confuses them. So they just stick with their initial gut feeling. All right, let's go on to number two, a machine learning analysis correlating road features with accident frequency finds that the most predictive variable for high crash risk is the presence of distracting billboards and other advertisements. Yes. Bob and, and George. George, you think this one is the fiction. <laughs> oh. Jay and Evan, you think this one is science. <laughs> Come on, Jay, Say hold it. my hand. And Say this it. one is... <gasps> The fiction. Yes. Uh, George, high five. Bink. So, yeah, it, it was other things. I just made up the uh, billboard thing. So, what do you think were the variables that were the most predictive? 
of uh, uh, cur- like curviness. Curvy lighting. Road curviness. The lighting was not. I almost made lighting the fiction. Oh, interesting. It wasn't mentioned. Uh, uh, confusing signs. Confusing, confusing signs. Yeah. Confusing signs was there. Uh, oh, the, nice. The condition uh, I, of I, the road. So if the a road, lady, a lady from the 1920s showing her slip. Mm-hmm, that would do it, but that. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think I had enough data on that. That gets okay. me every time. Yeah. So, so confusing signs, confusing pavement markings, mm. the pavement, pavement condition. Mark. The and here's another one: rapid changes in the speed limit was also in. Ah, uh, very okay. good. Yeah, that's yeah, all reasonable. Much better than. So I just had to think billboards. of one that wasn't one of those. That would be that would be right. plausible sounding, but yeah, but not real. I almost went with lighting, but then it went with churches. Billboards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very which, small rocks. Which means that <laughs> researchers find that short and simple corrective statements on social media help readers identify false information is it's true. Science. Wow, nice. that's that's like good news. Yeah. yeah, it is good news. But it is it does it does um, correlate with older data. Basically, anytime you engage the question of whether or not something is true, people then engage their skepticism, right? Uh, and so saying like, wait, this isn't true. But what what a couple of of, of you know, drilling down a bit, that was interesting. One is that, like, adding links and references and whatever didn't help. So, hmm. keep really, it, so, links and references didn't help. Yeah. So the the what this study showed was keep it short and simple, and like you don't have to have like a really big explanation with a lot of references to convince people. It, What's the thing I was thinking of that 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 that, that was, the, was the backlash researched. effect? Yeah, backlash. Yeah. That's the word. I couldn't think of backlash effect. Yeah, yeah, right? which is very topic specific. By the way, it doesn't happen with every topic. But mm. okay, okay. But uh, in fact, it usually doesn't happen. There's only a few exceptional topics where that does happen. Mm. But anyway, well, that's good. But the same study also found. That if you call into question correct items, it will also make people falsely think that they're fake. So it mm. cuts both ways pretty much equally, um, right? So you could also basically cast doubt on real news with sh- with simple false statements. And then if a trustworthy looking person yeah. does it, it's even no, worse. Seriously, that's that's true. While driving a car, yeah. then it's like forget about it. Yeah, near a billboard. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know. I think that kind of yeah. confirms what what we know is that the, yes. You, Making these statements it does influence people, and it's and it's not really about doing a deep dive on the evidence on the evidence or giving a reliable reference. It's just you know, and you can again, you could just as easily make them doubt real news as make them skeptical of fake news. What's better, do you think, to be to be more to have more doubt or be more like if you have to choose? I think all things think considered, more- it's better to engage people's doubt about something doubt, like to right, raise yeah. the probability that something is to make them yeah. think about it even if it's a wash you know at least at the right. end of the day if they're thinking through it maybe that'll have some kind of net positive effect i don't know but and the process will be there in the future hopefully so yeah, yeah. but but mm. you know who knows but what we do know is that social media is a mess right mm. and it's just it's, yeah <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. this is why it's a wash in misinformation. Yeah, it's it's a short attention span kind of just like quick hits, and it's when when really as we know everything's more complicated than you think, and you really got to get down to the bottom of issues before then you could say if something yeah. legit or not. And that superficial d- approach to any kind of any significant topic is just you're just going to be reflecting. Your biases and the last thing you heard. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's why it's so depressing. I don't know about you guys. I, I can't. I don't. I know Jay's strategy is like to not consume political news or any kind of news. I can't do that. I just have to. I'm, I, I read news. And damn, I don't know why I do this though. I read the comments. I usually read like the first 20, 30 comments oh to an article. <laughs> it yeah. And it is just, it makes you weep for <laughs> humanity. I mean, just. Yeah. It's just yeah. amazing how misinformed, how superficial, how illogical. The average commenter is. I don't know if that's the average person, but maybe it's only mm-hmm. it says it's a says only something about people who choose to leave a comment. But it's so it's all it's mostly misinformation. It's just amazing, and maybe that's a confirmation bias on my part. Oh, um, maybe because that's what I notice. Or they're trying to get a rise out of the, the people who are reading the comments, and therefore they'll I mean, post there's, things that usually, are, that you, are exaggerations. Usually, you, know? you can tell that yeah, this guy's a troll. You know, this is troll. This this guy's an ideologue. You know, whatever. He's just pounding the drum for his, whatever his side. But then there's a lot of like sincere, but just straight up misinformation. Mm-hmm. You know, like they just believe mm-hmm. something false. They've clearly haven't invested the 
three minutes it would take to figure out if that was true or not by researching it online, by doing, you know, a reason, halfway reasonable Google search would tell you, wait, wait a minute, that may not be true. I need to look into that a but little bit They wouldn't more. believe it, Steve. They just or, wouldn't or they've had a would... different personal experience too. That's that's the thing that oh, yeah. always is like, you know, my experience was not what the data says. Yeah. So therefore the data is wrong. Right. Yeah. And it's like, no, you're just one data point mm -hmm. within the data. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And it doesn't matter what the quote unquote <laughs> experts say because, right, right. you know, it's scary, man. It's scary to think that there has been a very, very strong shift away from believing people with, facts, with legitimate yeah. expertise. Went, went through a massive thing here in Bethlehem with our parking garage. With like the, the, the garage that I've been parking in for 30 years is very old. It's like 50 years old and they're knocking it down and they're replacing oh. it with a new one. And it's like the new plan. They studied the garage for three years and they realized the garage that was there was too big. It was, ah. it was 40% empty 85% of the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Like they studied in 15 minute Sounds increments. Sounds compelling. Yeah. They studied it like literally for 15 minute increments for three years. Like when are people parking here throughout the entire year? I parked there. Before. And it's like, you've, yeah, you've all parked there. It's like, it's too big. So they're going to, they're going to, you know, make it shrink it down from 770 spaces to 530 spaces. And then they're going to have the rest of the block will have something else, like some other kind of cool building or something. Well, the uproar, because everyone at some point couldn't find a parking space. Mm -hmm. So in their mind, it's like, how could you build a smaller thing? Uh, bah, bah. And it was this absolute ignoring of the data. And, and I, you know, I had to, I had to comment it. I went to city, city hall and there was open pu public meetings and I had to comment because it's like, I've been living here for 30 years. Like I've always found a space and the data says we don't need a huge garage. So like, trust the data, like, please, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. But no, just vehement. Good nope. for you, man. Nope. Not my experience. Not my experience. So no. Nope. Yeah. How can the city do this? It's amazing. It was just this beautiful skeptic, like, you know, every kind of logical fallacy <laughs> okay. poured out in front of me. And I just like got to watch it and try to counter it as best as, as best as I could as an individual. And yeah, they, they ended up voting on for the smaller new garage. It's going to be, it's going right. to be great. It's going to be great because the people on city council like trusted the data, which was wonderful to watch happen. But oh my gosh, so frustrating. But there's also another question there and that is how much reserve do you build in for sure. rare events? Right. Sure. So for that right. one time a year or whatever, mm -hmm. when you need the an extra hundred parking music spaces. fest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have two events. We have Christmas and we have music fest. There's August and December mm -hmm. and those things. You know, the problem is, you know, the city basically pays whatever it is, forty thousand dollars per space. Let's say per parking Oof. space. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now do, you, really? now do you build? You know, do you build the building? To be a thirty-one million dollar building, which is only going to be used again, it's going to, it's going to be one hundred percent full two percent of the time, you know, or, or whatever. Or you build, and then you can't get the loan approved because banks realize, like, no, park, big parking garages don't get approved anymore. So we're not going to approve that bank. We're not going to approve that loan unless the city signs off on it. And if the city signs off on it, they default on the loan. Yeah. The taxpayers pay for. It. So it's like wow. all this stuff was thought through, you know. And it's nice. like, well, but I couldn't find a space last August. So obviously, yeah, you know, so it's like, therefore, no. yeah. or you just have event parking, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny, they were presenting and they said, look, like people make adjustments. It's like, you can't keep building highways bigger and bigger and bigger to help traffic. It right? actually doesn't even help. It doesn't help because it'll, it, it'll it fill, fill to the up. size that yeah. is built. Induced demand. Yeah. Right. Induced. And there's a certain thing of like, people know like, okay, during music fest or during Christmas, you can't really park there. So you make other plans. You go to the other garage two blocks away or the other garage. There's like 2,000 parking <laughs> oh, spaces within five minute walk. Blocks, you know. That's what I mean. So it's like, it was just so, it was just so funny that like all this stuff was addressed. And just again and again and again, people kept saying, did anyone well, get up there Christmas? and like ramble something totally incoherent but, that made you face palm? But George, oh, that, no. that is human psychology though. <laughs> Absolutely. We are, Absolutely. we are paranoid about scarcity. Scarcity sure. freaks us out and we hoard yeah. that yeah. this is like a run on the bank or like yeah. why the tulip thing happened. Like whenever anything seems right. like scarce resource, people start to gobble it up. That's why they remember like the, Stores masks, ran out of get masks they ran out of toilet in, paper in two days. Yeah, when the, absolutely. I mean, there's absolutely. other reasons for that, but there's, but yeah, that's a real thing. Scarcity, hoarding, paranoia. Sure, sure. You know, we're, we're evolved to have those emotions, yeah, and it's hard to yeah. counter them with facts and 
Sign right. to me. Come on, George. Yay, brain. I know, I know. It's just so fun to watch it. Kind of not fun, but it's so curious to watch it play out. out in real to, life. To, to, to I will never like park in that parking garage again. Oh, that's right, because they're tearing it down. The new one's going to be amazing. Yeah, it's already <laughs> half gone. It's, it's, it's astonishing how fast they're knocking it down. It's amazing. I hope they're doing a time lapse. Uh, I'm um, sure someone is, yeah. Cool. yeah. All right, Evan, give us a quote. Starving brains can hallucinate. But even well-fed minds can convince themselves they can feel something which simply isn't there. It's by Jonathan Jerry, who's the science communicator over at McGill University, Office for Science and Society. I mentioned him earlier in my news item. And uh, I liked this quote because, you know, it's a it's, it's a catchy little quote, but it also kind of means, you know, it reminds us that even the kind of the, you know, people who are intelligent, smart, you know, can still be in a way fooled either by themselves or someone else about things that really don't exist. I, I like this quote a lot too, but uh, it reminds me recently on one, of my, on, uh, one of my blog posts, I wrote about the fact that, you know, artificial intelligence can hallucinate. And somebody said they didn't like that metaphor because uh, it's not what people do. And I'm like, no, that's pretty much exactly what people do. <laughs> You know, in, in fact, it's a great metaphor, you know, because all because he was saying, no, that's not what people do. What the AIs are doing, they're constructing, you know, the their things and sometimes they construct it wrong. It's like, yeah, you just described exactly what your right. brain does. We <laughs> construct right. everything and sometimes we construct it wrong and it doesn't have a solid relationship with reality. Of course, none of it has a one-to-one -one relationship with reality. And if it drifts too far from reality, we call that a hallucination. Or an illusion, right? An optical hey. illusion or whatever. So it's actually a really great analogy. Um, so then that's right. And starving brains do hallucinate more. If you're yeah. if some part of your brain, like if your visual cortex is not is not getting a lot of input, it just starts making stuff up just to keep itself active, you know? You literally do then have visual hallucinations from the lack of stimulation. Cool. Good quote. Thank you, Evan. Thank All you. All right, George, thanks for joining us this week. It's always a blast. Hey. George, thank you. Thanks, I appreciate George. it so much. George. Thanks, Texas. guys. Yeah, yeehaw. Yeah, Can't wait. we will see you soon in Texas, and thank you all for joining me this week. Thank you, sure, man. My pleasure. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 